there's background noise so when you're if you're if i'm talking can you mute when i'm talking uh let me let me find the mute button okay uh should be working oh I, I, yeah i can mute yeah okay yeah just just one uh so we don't get a lot of background noise on your end with the sure. cars all right welcome everybody can everybody hear us good we uh I was on a different computer, and that computer doesn't have all the patch ins to use NDI and Skype. So I had to switch back to the other computer. And then on top of that, the internet has been in and out in my area in the last couple of days. So service outages, not my fault. I think we're doing good. But today we have with us David the Real Met White. Can you tell us what that means? I've never known what the name is. <laughs> well,. It's it's it, I I came up with that name I think like three years ago. Uh, so it's basically the real Mediterranean vice. That's pretty much what it means. And long story short, it was basically like a joke we did in a politics server. To uh, it's it's we called anyone that was from the Middle Eastern region Medvite, and I just basically ad adopted that and went on with it. <laughs> okay. Yes, I see. 50 people saying volume up. Yeah, it only takes a couple people. Thank you. Is the volume better now? We've got it up about 30%, Tristan says. All right. Is, is it my volume no, or no, is it it's, yours? It's over here. On, I always have to fool with the... One of these has to be turned down. I think it's the um, input capture. All right. Uh, All right. I, say something, David. All right. Test, test, test. And then can you guys hear me okay? Are we both good? Hopefully we are. <clears throat> Wait for the chat to catch up. Mm -hmm. Now it's better. My volume is too low or what? La, la, Tristan says we're perfect. And that means if anything are... is good for Tristan, it's good for me. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, thank you, Tristan. Slightly better. Host is okay. Mine is lower. Ah, uh, uh, okay. So move mine up a little bit. Ah, uh, okay. So Mediterranean white is that what you're talking about? Like a Mediterranean yeah, hockey? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Pretty much. Okay. And then, um, I mean, I, go ahead. you know, you can just call me David. That's how I go by. That, that's my baptismal name, so I prefer to be called that. No. Okay, cool. Uh, so David is with us, and we've got a discussion. We want to talk about three issues today in the main. I'm sure we'll touch on other things as well. We're going to yep. talk about uh, Council of Florence. We're going to talk about Oriental Orthodox, Chalcedon, Cyril, up into the Sixth Council, Maximus, etc. And we're going to talk about... Um, do a little AMA and pitfalls for people who move towards orthodoxy. Now, you have been in my Discord server. We've had a lot of good conversations. You've got, you run a YouTube channel. I've got his channel linked there if you guys want to follow him. He does a lot of apologetics-based videos and chill streams. and He's really been cranking out good content, so I'm glad to have him with us. Do you want to start by telling us just a little bit about how were you you're, without doxing yourself, your background, and how you got to orthodoxy? All right, yeah. I mean, thank you for uh, praising my videos. I'm basically an Orthodox Christian living in Turkey. That's pretty much where I live. I live in Constantinople, so this city for the Orthodox Christians. Um, so tell about myself. I'm pretty much, you know, what I do on YouTube is pretty much apologetics-based videos, as Jay says. Anything that catches my attention uh, something that, you know, I feel like I need to do a response about, I do it on YouTube, and um, that's pretty much what I do, and one of the, part of the reasons why I wanted to do the stream is because I've seen a lot of people, uh, Orthodox Christians, moving from Orthodoxy to Oriental Heterodoxy, or uh, a, lot of, a lot of Roman Catholics using the Council of Florence argument, and that's one of the things that interests me right now and so that's why i'm doing it so generally speaking yeah i'm i'm an orthodox christian in turkey i was actually baptized in the united states i uh i lived there for one and a half years went to university there met really great people like a good friend of mine anastasius who actually uh, told me to watch you uh jay 
and yeah, that's pretty much what it will be. So I'm pretty much usually on YouTube. I'm pretty active on Twitter online and I'm pretty active on Jay's Discord and many other Discord servers as well. Yeah, uh, we have a lot of apologetic debates and uh, you and and uh, Glenn Dalal and J2 Nick and mm-hmm. Snack. and uh, So we had, you know, all the ortho bros kind of doing the rounds yep. going on. Doing a lot of apologetic works and thank you for um, joining in the battle. So let's start with Florence. So um, I know a decent amount about the Council of Florence. I come, you know, as everybody knows, from a long period of Roman Catholicism Um so I've read the Council of Florence multiple times, all the way through all the documents. Um, I, I have a decent sense of it. I'm not an expert on... Some people spend their whole lives just studying the Council of Florence. Um, I'm going to put up here in a moment a decent essay that I read recently uh, from uh, Metropolitan uh, Herothios, who has a good essay from Father Peter Hears from his, uh, one of his websites, talking about Florence. Uh, I'll just link that just because it's a good analysis relating to St. Mark of Ephesus. But you have been uh, researching this more uh, in the in, in recent uh, a, a recent note. So I'm going to let you kind of tell us where you want to go with this and remind everybody that we will be taking super chats. We are by the towards the end of the discussion, we're going to have uh, AMA. You can ask me, you can ask David. Uh, any kind of uh, questions that you want, it's going to basically function like another one of the apologetics classes. I might label it apologetics class number three. We'll see. But uh, David, tell us about Florence and what you have been uncovering. Yeah, so I, I just want to start with why I even got interested in Florence, because I see so many Roman Catholics using Florence as an argument against the Eastern Orthodox. It's, it's supposed to be this gotcha argument. Uh, and, and basically the argument is, is, oh, your bishops accepted Florence, why are you not accepting Florence? We saw this from uh, those that called themselves Most Holy Family Monastery, Vatican Catholic dudes. And so I looked into um, Vasil Popov's book on Council of Florence. I don't know if you read his book, but uh, he is a, I think he was like a Russian seminarian in the 19th century when he wrote this book. And uh, while I was reading the book, like throughout the book, there, is, there are so many like so many, so much information in that book that I feel like is missing out on, that we are missing out on in the Florence debate. And uh, we kind of have to understand with Florence, right, that you had the Byzantine Empire, you had the Roman Empire on the east that only had a single city, and that was Constantinople, and you had a huge Ottoman Empire that was going further west and west and west and going further on. So this was the intention of the council itself and anyone should agree with this this seems pretty common sense is that it's political right just like the council of Lyons, i think 150 years uh, back this is pretty much a political council it's not really the intention is not theological the the bishops in the east they didn't feel like they had to unite right it's something that the emperor kind of told the bishops hey you're supposed to do this and the bishop said i guess we have to right because the emperor told us to do it so with Florence, there's a lot of different things to talk about, really. Um, I'm aware that a lot of people focus on the theological debate aspect. I'm going to talk a little bit about the debates, not too much, but what I want to focus on is uh, how in Orthodoxy and in Roman Catholicism, one council can be deemed ecumenical or, or invalid. So even before we go into Florence, and you've done a video on this, I've done a video on this, that on uh, church epistemology, right, how... We know what councils are orthodox, what doctrines are uh, true, cheating, true teachings and what doctrines are not. And so straight off the bat, I will say that even if Florence was a clean council, which it isn't at all, even if Florence was a clean council, there is still some problems. If uh, we have a very, uh, the, the fake orthodox love this can, the canon 15 of the first second council, I'm sure you heard of it, Jay, the, the canon of first second, the canon 15 where it talks about how if a bishop preaches heresy publicly and openly, he's a false bishop. Well, actually, that canon is dealing with issues like Florence, right? We have a pre-schism canon that says if you accept heresy publicly, you're a pseudo-bishop. Now, it doesn't take it to the full conclusion of the pseudo uh, of the pseudo aspect of a bishop, but we will say that accepting a council like Florence that teaches things contrary to the faith, like the filioque and so many other, like papal supremacy, so many other issues that was discussed in Florence. We will say that 
as a bishop, if you accept this council, you become a pseudo bishop, and we don't listen to what a pseudo bishop says in regards to theology. So, just straight from that, we can make a defense about how we can reject the, the Council of Florence. But I think the, a, a very strong argument regarding Florence is that if you go into Florence, there's so many issues with Florence, so many vices in procedure, that it is, I think, impossible to argue as a Roman Catholic to say that we ever accepted this council. Yes, we. you can argue that this council was never even accepted, or as I would like to strongly argue, that this council is not even a true actual council, that this was a, a robbery council, no different than Ephesus, uh, second Ephesus, which is we'll probably touch on as well in the stream. So that will be the introductory part, uh, like the end, like how we can reject the council. And regard the, regarding Council of Florence, um, there are multiple different things that is also worth mentioning regarding Florence. As I said, this is before we even like get in the council as well. And that is Council of Basel, which is the council that happened before Florence, which is, I think, as far as I know, is included in Florence, uh, in the Florentine Council. And the Council of Basel did something, Basel did something really strange. It, um, what it did was, there was, a, there was a council 20 years ago called Council of Constance, and it dealt, the West, it dealt with the Western Schism. And that Council of Constance, which elected a new pope, by the way, right? So this, this council is the source of the new line of papacy, a council of Constance said, says that a general council uh, is superior to, uh, let me find exactly, it says it declares that a general council draws its powers immediately from God and that even the Pope is subject to a council's direction. So 20 years ago, the, 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 current, uh, the council of Constance used this as a, as a legitimate, as a, as a form of, uh, as a, as to make the new line of papacy legitimate, as to make the new popes legitimate. And then at the end of the Council of Florence, this was completely ignored, right? So we can already see in Florence that several decrees are being ignored uh, in a council that happened 20 years ago. And if you want to get into what happened uh, in, in the council itself, uh, there, there's many vices in procedure. There's mainly three vices in procedure that I want to focus on. It's, um, it's the, it's bribes, right? There are a lot of bri there are a lot of bribes going on in Florence that we can go into detail. There are a lot of false documents that was uh, relevant to Florence. That was relevant to the disputations happening in Florence, and pretty much nearly all of the Roman Catholic documents were forged in one way or the other. And the final issue will be the worrying right. right. doctrines and events and, and uh, stuff, stuff that the Roman Catholic Church or Roman Catholics themselves won't even accept if, if we pointed that out to them. And there are several of them that I will say Roman Catholics won't ever accept if, he, if they want to accept Florence fully. Right. So, so should we like move into Florence and what happened? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. And I want to, um, I want to add too that, uh, I did put the links in the chat to, uh, Metropolitan Herodias's really good essay on the fact that one thing to be considered is that this was an attempted reunion council. I'm sure Dave is going to get into that. But one thing that a lot of people miss is the attitude change of St. Mark of Ephesus. So uh, at the beginning of the council, he was very, um, positive. He had a very positive attitude about about reunion, the possibility of reunion. And by the end of this uh, experience, he was found it very dismal and came to the conclusion that the Latins are a pseudo church. So you can't take, for example, a comment early before the Council of Saint Mark of Ephesus saying, "Hey, maybe we can, you know, view these people." I think he says something like "long lost brothers" or something like that, and you know, uh, we can find common ground and, and eventually work together towards a, a reunion here. And then, you know, after his bad experience throughout this pseudo council, he comes to the conclusion that no, uh, they are a heretical and schismatic body. And hence why all of the icons of St. Mark of Ephesus, well, not all of them, but many of them as pillar of Orthodox, uh, doctrine show him uh, either, uh, trampling the Pope or the Pope kissing his feet. So um, this is, uh, in fact, one of the strongest arguments in Orthodox Christianity against ecumenism. It is, in fact, not a proof of ecumenism. Go ahead. 
And to make notes on the ecumenism factor, the council itself, I mean, the idea behind it is very ecumenistic as well. And what happened in the end is that Orthodox rejected the ecumenical aspect and completely rejected the council right, as exactly. well, embraced the ecumenistic area of the council. So that's one of the strong arguments yeah, against Florence. Well, this is, yeah, this is like the thing the Roman Catholics go to is they're always like, you had a, you came to the council and accepted it. Uh, no, acceptance does not mean that because they think that, oh, uh, if I, if four of five, if three of five, if two of five, if, you know, it, it really would, it wouldn't even matter if all five of the Pentarchy accepted. Uh, Pentarchy is a an idea that evolves over time in the history of the church. It's not some magical thing that itself, you know, makes the council infallible in our view or in anybody's view. So that's a, the Roman Catholics consistently misunderstand the Orthodox view of the church and of councils. And so they read Roman Catholicism into our church, and then they think, oh, you know, well, if five of the guys did it, then that's like your your five-headed pope, right? They made the decision. Or if three of the five, then that's the, you know, <laughs> what, uh, you know, a, a percentage, like three out of five voted it, so it's true. No, it doesn't work like that. And speaking of the Pentarchy, I mean, even if that was the case, uh, right after the council, the Patriarchates of Jerusalem, Antioch, and Alexandria, uh, rejected all it. of the Eastern, yeah, they all instantly rejected it, immediately rejected yeah. it, so it doesn't even matter. Right. But we'll get into, but we'll start to understand how they even accepted the council in the first place. And the first area I want to tackle is the bribes, right? There are two aspects of bribery that was going on in the council. And uh, the first aspect is... Uh, we have to understand, right, the, the Greek bishops, they're not rich people. They're not, uh, the only city that the Greek bishops have is Constantinople, right? They have their own patriarchates in Ottoman-occupied lands, like Kizikum and uh, Ephesus itself, right? That's an Ottoman-occupied land at the time. So they don't have a good time. They basically don't have a good time. They are dependent on the pay of the pope when the council is going on. So they all move, they all go to Italy, they all go to Florence. And so how are they going to, you know, these councils, they don't end in five days, right? These things take time. This council in particular, it, take, it took more than a year, as far as I know. And even then, like sh even short councils, they take months. So they will have to be dependent on someone's pay and they were dependent on the pay of the Pope himself. Well, oops. <laughs> <laughs> That's my phone notification. Um, anyways, the Pope himself. You've got Roman Catholics standing outside your door listening, laughing at you. Right? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, so in regards to the bribes, one thing the Pope did is that they came to an agreement with how they're going to be using, uh, how they're going to be paid, right? And the Pope said, well, we're going to pay you X amount of money every month, right? How does that sound? And the, and the bishop said, yeah, that's fine. And the emperor said, that's fine. And then as the council moved on, you know, you got the first month of payment. Okay, that's fine. That's great. But then certain controversies occurred during the council and uh, certain things that the papacy did not like. And something as simple as, you know, where the bishops are going to be seated. I'm not kidding you. There is a dispute over where the bishops are going to be seated in the council. And in it, the whole issue is about status. Right? The bishop wanted to have the had a sort of status where he was the king of the church and the bishops and the Greek bishops were supposed to be under him, whereas the Greek patriarch, the ecumenical patriarch, basically, no, we're supposed to be equal, you know, like, let's at least, you know, pretend to be equal or, or something of the sort. So that dispute, even that dispute, the Pope cut payment of uh, Greek bishops. And over time, as many other disputations arose, such as disputations on the filioque, which was a very heated one, uh, papal supremacy and all that stuff. The Pope, every time the Greek party did something that the Pope didn't like at all, the Pope will cut payments. And there's even a pay schedule that uh, I took <laughs> note of. But basically, I didn't know this. Yeah, basically, uh, there was like five periods of payment. And between the third and the fourth payment, four months passed. So for four months, the Greek bishops had no payment. They were living off scraps. They had to sell their own vestments to survive. Right? And the fourth and fifth payment, that also lasted four months. So for four months, they will have periods of months they where they had no money. They had to ration food in order to survive. And the argument here is really simple. If the Pope is basically making uh, these patriarchs, making these bishops dependent on his money, and he can cut it any time he wants, how can you argue that these bishops made the decision in the end 
out of their own free will. You cannot argue this. This mm -hmm. itself, I will say, is a complete refutation of Council of Florence. It shows that the fact that the Roman Catholic Church considered this as an ecumenical council, I think this will prove that the Roman Catholic Church is a false church. <laughs> and this isn't the only aspect right. of bribery. There's other briberies that happen at the end of the council as well. And what happened at the end of the council was that uh, there were some people that were, you know, skeptical. They were they weren't anti-unionists, but they weren't pro-unionist either. They were sure, they weren't sure what to vote. And um, I believe, uh, let me find his name. Uh, it was a Greek bishop, Dorotheus of Midilli. Dorotheus of Midilli, mm -hmm. who, was a, who was part of the Greek party. He was an Orthodox, but he was a very pro-union. Um, Bishop who got rewarded by the Pope, by the way, he became a patriarch of Constant, Latin patriarch of Constantinople after the council ended, even though in reality he never was. Like, he never got his office officially, so it was just like a title. He, uh, Dorotheus of Mithili, what he did is that, oh, sorry, I mixed up. Messarion was the one who uh, became Latin patriarch, but Dorotheus, he went to the Pope and said, Hey, you know, I know these people, they're like not they're like not pro-union, they're not anti-union, they're somewhere in the middle. So I think you should bribe these people. I think you should like call these people and bribe these people. And the Pope did. Like the Pope straight up said, Okay, that sounds like a good idea. And some of the so not all, but some of the pro-union votes in the council, they were bought. They were bought for. Uh they were bought for by the papacy. And so these two factors will raise a huge question on how could one argue that these Greek bishops even voted willingly? Even after the council, Antony of Heraclea, after he came to Greece, said, I accepted this council uh, uh, not of my own will. It was involuntary. I didn't accept this out of my own. I just had to because of all the stuff that went on. And so this aspect, the, uh, the fact that the papacy bribed Greek bishops throughout the council will show that the that the Florentine Council is definitely not an ecumenical one and that the Roman Catholic Church has to, you know, any Roman Catholic has to look at it and say, you know, this is this is a problem, right? And so that will pretty much uh, cover all of the aspects of bribery going on. Do you have any comments on that? Just that um, this aspect of the history I didn't know about. Uh, the Is this in the Basil book? I've not read the Basil Popoff book. Um, yeah, yeah, it's the Basil Popoff book. And the source is uh, Sylvester Sulopoulos, and he's a con contemporary historian who detailed all of all of the things that happened. So mainly there are two sources, like uh, Greek sources in that, in that area. There's Dorotheus, who was very pro-union. He's the one that told the Pope to bribe people. And then you have Sylvester Sirupoulos, who is the de he's the great deacon of uh, uh, Hagia Sophia, I think. I might be wrong, but he's a, he's a deacon of the church. So Sylvester Sirupoulos is a grand ecclesiarch, and uh, he most of the stuff that I'm talking about, most of the stuff in Vasil Popov's book is from Sylvester Sirupoulos. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, so that's new to me. Remember, if you would, if I'm talking... Try to remember to mute on your end because people are saying that there's a little bit of an echo if uh, if you have your um, mic not muted when I'm talking. But yeah, that's very that's very interesting because we we one thing we forget if we're very into theology and even when we start to read church history, it's a mistake that I made uh, many years ago. I'm not talking about you, David. I'm just saying in general is to not think about the political side of things, so we forget the. Frankish influence, you know, over Charlemagne and, and the attempt to set up a, a, you know, a rival emperor in the West. This is a big problem when, it, when there was already an accepted Orthodox emperor in the East. And then you start to realize that, that politics has a, a, a lot to do with this, especially, uh, you know, all the way back into the patristic period and even up, you know, to, to Florence, like you're talking about. So, you know, there have always been these issues of corruption. There have always been these issues of simony and uh, the investiture controversy. So, so the bribery issue is new to me, so I'm glad to learn about that. Yeah, and uh, politics is unfortunate. As you said, politics is pretty important in these regards as well. I mean, even all of the ecumenical councils, there is an aspect of politics in all of the ecumenical councils, but it's not as, like, riddled with bribery and and all sorts of filth like it's it's, it's happening in council mm -hmm. of florence like if you look at the ecumenical councils and then you look at the false ecumenical council of florence there is a huge difference a lot of stuff went wrong and so another another thing that went wrong that i want to uh, focus on is basically the timeline of florence 
so at the beginning, as you said, Saint Mark of Ephesus was completely, you know, he was he considered them brothers, uh, the Roman Catholics as brothers. And one one of the things that started to change his mind is that well, there was a disputation on purgatory. Now this disputation was private, and so it was really just a exchange of ideas. And one thing to note, and that Saint Mark of Ephesus constantly talks about in the council is that the Roman Catholics use the word concept fallacy. And there's a lot of different heretical yes, groups thank that you. do the same thing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Let's definitely make this, this point key. Uh, keep going. Uh, so an example of the word concept fallacy that the Roman Catholics did in terms of purgatory is that they looked at the second book of Maccabees, chapter 12, 39 to 45. They looked at that and said, look, this teaches purgatory. And then St. Mark of Ephesus says, well, we have... We look at the same verse, but we have another doctrine. This doesn't lead to purgatory. And then they used certain quotations from the forest. These are these weren't forged so far. Not 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 these, but uh, they used certain quotations from the fathers. And Saint Mark of Ephesus looked and said, "Well, first of all, um, none of you know Greek. I know Greek, so I know what these guys are talking about." And then he uh, went into detail what these fathers talked about because most of the quotations were from Greek fathers. And he, he basically stated that. The, the general idea was that just because they're using these words doesn't mean that they're conveying the same idea that you're conveying. And one example was, I believe, um, St. Gregory of Nyssa. Uh, they said, St. Gregory of Nyssa, yes, he's using your terminology, but holistically, if you look at the things that St. Gregory of Nyssa says, I, they said, I fail to see how this, this is something, something that, that can be incorporated into his theology because this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But, what he says and these are mostly private disputations so this is not the part where things go back one of the initial uh, public disputations that Sir saint mark of ephesus wanted to go with is uh, regarding filioque so the the roman catholic said okay what do you want to debate we have a list of topics where the papacy stuff like that and what do you want to talk about and the greek said let's talk about the filioque let's talk about the creed and then saint mark of ephesus he said in in the uh, before the session so he said uh, let's, let's look, look at, at the ecumenical, ecumenical council canons regarding the creed, and let's, and let's compare, compare it, it and just start, start talking from there. there. And the Roman Catholics, the, the bishops, they didn't want that. They said uh, they tried their best to make that not happen at all. They even went to uh, Greek, uh, the ecumenical patriarch privately and said, you should stop this, like this, this shouldn't happen. Eventually it happened, but the Roman Catholics basically... Uh, Change, change the viewpoint. viewpoint. They change. Oh, this is something that the Greeks wanted. wanted. So we're just entertaining them. them. Uh, this, this is not. This is not in accord with the papacy. This is in accord with the Greeks. And so they change it to something that's completely. Like, like the viewpoint was almost like. like uh, oh, it's a disputation that doesn't even matter. matter. And so, so from, from that, that's, that's already one of the red flags. You know, why will they even do such a thing? You're just talking about ecumenical council canons. Why? Why do you want to stop talking about them? And what essentially happens is that uh, St. Mark, Saint Mark of Ephesus, Ephesus reads the Ecumenical Council uh, canons, and, and from the third, ca uh, third council, all throughout the seventh, seventh council itself, he sufficiently proves that the creed should not be changed with. He says, look, we have all of these canons in all of these Ecumenical Councils that says you should not change the creed. What was the original form of the creed? Without the filioque. Therefore, the filioque is wrong. That was his, that was his argument. And the first step, so there's two steps in the Roman Catholic response. The first step was that they tried to argue that it was actually read. And one of the funny things that happened is that Gemistos Platon, out of all people, called them out on it. And he, and so they made they, they put out this seventh, a document from the Seventh Ecumenical Council. And they say, uh, they said that, oh, you know, there's Filioque in the Seventh Ecumenical Council. And then Vasil Popov even notes that, uh, that this is a forgery. And then, then Gemistus Platon uh, uh, straight up like goes, goes on to say, say and I'm quoting directly this from, if the testimonies of your copy and your historian were just, or at least had been long ago known in the Church of Rome, then no doubt your Thomas Aquinas's and your saints preceding will not have made use of so many arguments yes. to prove the validity of addition. So he's saying that why are you using this document now when none of your saints even used this argument before? Yeah, it would have been one of the top arguments for centuries, right? Pretty much. And why is this coming up now? And he's saying, well, the reason why it's coming up now, again, Mr. Spleton concludes, is it's a forgery. This is not something that actually was read out. And 
many monks and Vasit Popov even notes, many of the people listening to the council at that point, they were like, oh, you know, the Orthodox, they might be right on this issue. And so John de Montenegro, uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the bishops or cardinals, who was basically the Roman Catholic version of Saint Mark of Ephesus, except he had no uh, character, so to speak. His defense is now the modern Roman Catholic defense. He used the defense that oh, it is not actually an addition; it is an explanation, right? So. It is explaining that, uh, that that is not an addition. That's just explaining the creed. So it's not an addition, right? We're not adding new things to the creed. We're just explaining the truth of the matter. Yeah. And sophistry, basically. Mm-hmm. Yes, sophistry. And one thing that Saint Mark of Ephesus does uh, to refute that, and one and the, he uses the Kyrillian refutations in two different instances. So the first instance uh, he used the Kyrillian refutation is that he says, look. The first dogmatization of, of this uh, this creed, where it says it should not be changed, is from this uh, Ephesian council, the first Ephesian council where St. Kirill presided. St. Kirill himself, and the, the whole dispute of the Ephesian council, it was about uh, Theotokos. It was about uh, her being the mother of God, right? That's a huge aspect of the first Ephesian council. And so he argued, well, if what you're saying really is true, if that's really the case... Uh, then how is it even possible? How is it even possible uh, that Saint Kirill did not use any additions, any explanations to the creed by adding Theotokos into the creed? And then there is more sophistry from uh, John de Montenegro, but he didn't really answer it properly. It's it's kind of like a gotcha moment that really defeated the, that defeated his argument. Another note on Saint Kirill is that in terms of the filioque argument. Uh, whether it is something true, whether it's something existed in the fathers. St. Mark of Ephesus notes that um, when it comes to the argument regarding uh, when it came to the Nestorian Creed in the first Ephesian Council, the Nestorian Creed was read out, and the Nestorian Creed stated that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone. Now, a lot of things were disputed with the Nestorian Creed. A lot of things were criticized regarding the Nestorian Creed. One of the things that never got criticized was it stating that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone. And then in other dispute, disputations, with uh, the, a disputation with Theodoret of Cyrus and St. Kirill, uh, Theodoret of Cyrus accused St. Kirill of heresy because he thought St. Kirill believed in the filioque. This is in the council, right? This uh, St. Mark of Ephesus notes this, that this happened between a disputation. Theodore Tosio says, you believe in the filioque? You're a heretic. And then St. Kirill says that, no, I don't believe in the filioque. The Holy Spirit is proceeded from the Father alone, but it is not, uh, it's not alien by essence. So they're consubstantial, but uh, the Holy Spirit is proceeded from the Father alone. Right. So that was the response that St. Kirill used, and this uh, St. Mark of Ephesus notes this later on as an argument. And really, even today and, and during the Council, there was no proper... Uh, response to this argument and well let me let me add to the if this were a valid line of reasoning then what we should literally have is a gigantic ever-expanding creed slash plus explanation that has been given to us in every century from rome why doesn't rome just continually expand the creed with its explanation so that in every century's controversy you can just have a simple solution to every one of those that rome has approved why didn't they just do that if the Roman view is correct, we would have like a hundred page creed that has an explanation addition from the Pope explaining every controversy. It would be easy, wouldn't it? If the Roman view was right. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's again, that's one of the arguments that St. Mark of Ephesus uses. And you know, you can add in Theotokos, you can add in many other different things. Well, every controversy should just have a papal explanation <laughs> added yeah, to the yeah, creed in every century. Yeah, even today they don't do this, and when they can, when they fully can do this, and even before Vatican I, they never did any of this stuff. So, it is it is pretty shown both by Gemistus Platon, uh, who's a very interesting character in the Council, and Saint Mark Ephesus himself. Uh, one thing to really take from the Council as well is that not only are most of the Roman Catholic documents complete forgeries, and even the Vatican itself, I think, admits it. I mean, Vasil Popov notes this in his 
in his footnotes that like every time there's a false document, even used by the Greeks, by the way. So we use some false documents, but I'll explain them, you know, the detail of them sooner. But every time there's a supposed quote about a father believing in the Fulioko or about a father that believes in papal supremacy, it always ends up being a forgery. And so this is another, another vice in procedure, and it shows that people, people like Eric Yabara, who constantly, constantly all they do is a quote, 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 quote mind the fathers. Well, first of all, how do we even know that they are accurate quotations? One of the examples, back when I was... Yeah, actually, the one of the ones that he used in our debate was a forgery, actually. Yeah, yeah funny enough. One thing that happened to me personally is that back when I was a complete noob in theology... Um, I, I made the I made the typical response regarding the, the Philiric. I said, well, the Third Ecumenical Council anatomizes changes. And the, the, the Roman Catholic literally used the, the forged document of uh, the Philiric being said in the Seventh Ecumenical Council. He said, look, you know, uh, in the Ecumenical Councils, all of them said the Filioque. And, I, and at the time, I didn't know it. But then looking back at it now, those are the documents that he's referring to. And some of them even use those first documents today. Some of them are not even aware that they're forged. Yeah, and exactly. This is a huge problem in you know theological academia. I think that needs to be solved, both in the in the Roman Catholic circle mostly, of course, because they rely yeah they're so still relying, especially the trad Catholics. Like trad Catholics are the trads who typically don't have a whole lot of theological study under their belt unless they're at some trad seminary, SSPX or something. They don't really verge into the uh, forgery realm of things because it would prove pretty dangerous to the whole scheme. So, I mean, I've, I've even met trads that still accept the donation of Constantine, which is ridiculous. I mean, everybody, I don't know anybody who, except maybe two or three trads <laughs> who still accept the donation of Constantine is a real thing. Oh, Sat uh, you see, Jay, Satan made it so that everyone accepted it as forgery. But in reality, I can see, I can see... I can see what, what God, God is really trying, trying to do. do. I, I see that it's actually, actually a real, real, real document. document. I mean, that's that's, that's the, the sort of cult these people have in their mind, and some of these people I think are pretty lost. But to move on with the Council of Florence, um, and after the disputations on the Filioque, which again was very heated, even though it was supposed to be, you know, kind of like something that only the Greeks entertained themselves with. Um, after the disputations on the Filioque, two of the biggest uh, uh, bishops that argue against the Filioque, Antony of Heraclea and St. Mark of Ephesus, they both get banned from the Roman Emperor. Did you know that? They both get banned from uh, mm -hmm. John, John Palaiologos, from, mm. from the, the council. council. Okay. And even before the council, what is really interesting is that before the council even started, the Emperor, uh, John Palaiologos and uh, the Pope, they already verbally said that, yeah, we, we're going to be... Uh, this, this is going to end up in a union. So let's just work towards it. So both of them, they already want the union to happen. They don't care. They're, pr they're not primarily concerned with the theology. They just want the union to happen. The papacy wants the union to happen because more political power and, you know, more people in the church. And the East wants, to, wants it to happen. Why? Because, well, we're reduced to a single city and the Muslims own literally every single patriarch that we have at this point. And so we need help from the West. And this 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 plan to get help from the West is a is a plan in the Byzantine Empire for years. I mean, I believe Manuel Paralogos made a tour around Europe where he went to places as far as France to talk with their uh, kings, with their emperors, and basically ask them, beg them to, hey, you know, please help us. We got help us against the Ottomans. They're beating us. They're destroying us. Please help us. And after the council, we even. Like they, they got a response, right? The West decided to help. Uh, one of the weird things that the Roman Catholics do is that they say, oh, you know, the Constantinople got uh, conquered because you heretical Orthodox did not accept Florence. Well, interestingly enough, uh, the Crusade of Varna happened two years after Florence and Europe lost its two kings, uh, the Polish king, the Hungarian king, and I believe the Austrian king. Or Right, yeah, that, what, where, is that also yeah. punishment? Come on. Yeah, exactly. They used they lost like three Catholic kings, and then they lost Constantinople, and they completely got decimated by the Ottomans years afterwards. So is God punishing you too? So you yeah. guys are wrong. Yeah, too. that's a, that's just an arbitrary mind. argument that they just throw out. It's like it was a punishment for you, right? Like like the same thing doesn't happen in the West. Well, more like it's a punishment for us for accepting the union. Uh, right, exactly. That's what I think.
Yeah. yeah. So, so move, move on with the. Uh, by the way, I, I'm hearing echo. Uh, let me yeah, I have to okay. just. I just have to mute when you're talking. So go ahead. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Same. Um, so let me see. Let me check. So yeah, as as I mentioned, the emperor bans uh, Saint Mark of Ephesus and Antony of Heraclea from the council, and one thing, right? Uh, afterwards, the Pope tells the Greek bishops. This is the later part of the union. The Pope goes on to tell the Greek bishops, not on the patriarch himself, but the Greek bishops overall. He says, if you don't solve this union, because there's a lot of debates going on, there's still a stalemate, even if St. Mark of Ephesus got banned, there's still a lot of stalemate because the Greeks are simply not responding. Why are they not responding? Because the emperor told them not to respond, right? So the emperor itself, he is getting into the council and he's telling the bishops to what to do and what not to do. And so this is another vice in procedure, arguably from our side, but it still shows that the bishops, what they did, it was not out of their own volition. Right. The emperor is not like he's not a bishop in our church. He's not supposed to be uh, doing these things in the council. And so this is another argument where we can say, well, we could the only thing that we could have done is accept the council. And so uh, the, the pope says, if you don't solve this quick enough, if you don't get your Greek bishops to agree with us, I'm going to get you killed. He basically said, I'm going to leave you helpless. I'm not going to pay you. I'm not going I'm just going to leave you alone. I'm not going to let you get out of the country either. I'm going to let you stay here and I'm going to let you die. That's literally what the Pope to tells the Greek bishops uh, in private. And so you can see the Pope is absolutely not concerned with uh, dealing with the theology. He just wants the union to happen and he will do any sort of vice in procedure to get what he wants. And eventually, these are the reasons, these are the culmination of reasons why the Greek bishops eventually they had to, you know, decide to sign the union, even though I will say 90% of them didn't agree with the union. So, like, do you do you have any, like, anything to add regarding that? Because I'm going to move on. No, go ahead. Move. You, you can move on. Okay. So, another interesting thing that also vindicates our argument regarding Florence is that the anti-union bishops uh, privately gathered together and they anatomized um, uh, no, the, the Greek bishops, the pro-union bishops like Bessarion and uh, and the others and Dorotheus, they all pretty much anatomized those who were against the union. So this is before the union was signed. The Greek bishops gathered together and they anatomized people uh, that was against the union, that was against, you know, the Roman Catholic teaching on purgatory, the Roman Catholic teaching on pretty much everything, papacy, filioque, whatever. And another interesting thing, and this is a deal killer, I think, is that Patriarch Joseph dies before the union. Now, what's really interesting, and this is something that Dorotheus brings up, is that uh, the Patriarch Joseph, before dying, Apparently, he says that, oh, I accept every single Roman Catholic doctrine. I accept the union. Uh, and then the day after he writes the will, he dies. Now, here's what's really interesting. Dorotheus says that the will was written shortly uh, before he died. Right? He wrote the will. Uh, no, the will was written shortly after he died. Right? He, he told someone that was writing the will to write this down. And then he ended up dying. But the will is dated in the 9th. And he died in the tent. So there's a one day gap between those, uh, between the time of the death and the will being written. And so it's not shortly thereafter. There's an inconsistency in story. But what's even bigger than Dorotheus' uh, inconsistency is that during the time of the will being supposedly written, not a single Greek bishop mentions the will. They don't mention the will at all. As a matter of fact, Emeritus, he says that the council cannot be ecumenical. This is a Greek, what, well, uh, one of the people in the Greek party, he says, this is not an ecumenical council. This cannot be an ecumenical council because the patriarch died before signing it. Who's going to sign it then? Is it just going to be some bishops? Then it's not an ecumenical council. And he will say, yeah, he's correct. And the, because the patriarch died before he even got to sign the council, there's no reason for us to say, oh, okay, we, it's still an ecumenical council. No, this is still a huge issue that a Roman Catholic party, not, I'm not sure if it's the Roman Catholic party itself or it's the pro-Latin party that did this, most likely the pro-Latin party, but this is another one of those forgeries that was used to change the course of the Council of Florence. And I said, yeah, this is pretty, this is pretty big. I mean, how can the, 
Maybe for the Roman Catholics it is, but how can it be an ecumenical council for us? As far as we're concerned, it's just some bishops agreeing with some of the things that went down, right? Right. And, and, uh, mm -hmm. and so after the council was done, we're now reaching like what happened right after the council. Now, they, the Roman Catholics and the, and, the, and the Orthodox, they did a celebration, right? Uh, the ce celebratorial liturgy. Now, the first liturgy was a Latin rit liturgy. Where it was, you know, completely Latin. It uh, it said the creed. It said the filioque creed. I believe the Greeks, when they said the creed, didn't say the filioque. But I might be wrong on that. Uh, what did happen though is that <laughs> the Greek bishops, when it was time to receive the Eucharist, they refused to. They said, "No, we're gonna, not going to refuse. Uh, they went, we're not going to partake in the Eucharist." So what's going on? You just accepted the union, but you're not partaking in the. Roman Catholic Eucharist. So even after, right after the council, where there is a supposed union, you can see that the attitude of the Greek bishops, they they were like, I'm not going to take the Eucharist of this liturgy. I'm not going to do any of this. And I, that further vindicates the, the fact that the Greek bishops, they did not agree with the council at all. They they signed it, right? They, they signed it. The, the, the signature is not a forgery, but their will to sign it that, that's it's not there. It's not free, right? They were forced to sign it, as shown in the previous examples. And as I mentioned before, Antony of Heraclea, he himself says, I signed the union involuntarily. I don't agree with it. It is a single thing that this union says. And to finalize this uh, aspect of Council of Florence, what happened in Florence, the Vicin procedure, and so on and so forth, to finalize, I will say that many uh, Orthodox, when they returned, to uh, the empire, well, I would say the empire, but really they only re they had Constantinople and the Peloponnese to re return to. When they returned, first of all, most of the laity, most of the clergy completely disagreed with the council. They went against the union. And right. this is a very important aspect of our epistemology. And I noticed in my video on, uh, on epistemology is that laity are also part of the church. Now, we don't say that laity decides what is dogma, but we will say that any any apostolic church will say, well, our church is infallible, right? So how is our church infallible? What is the method of infallibility? Well, we will say whether a, a teaching is accepted by the church as a whole. And uh, now Roman Catholics, they're going to say, ah, oh, that's, that's kind of relativistic, don't you think? Well, Roman Catholics, that's exactly the same method you use. Many of the Francis defenders, as a matter of fact, how do they argue that Francis is a true pope? They don't look at the ancient canons. They don't look at the Roman Catholic saints regarding what a real pope is and what a fake pope is. They say, well, Francis is accepted by the church. That There you go. <laughs> he's, he's received by the church, and there you go. He's the pope. It's as simple as that. That's the argument that they themselves use. So receptionism is not only an orthodox uh, epistemolo epistemological tool, it's actually also a Roman Catholic tool, even for the set of Acantis, in fact. And so... When they try to argue about uh, how we know what is dogma, they're really just pointing out their own hypocrisy. And to get back on Florence, most of the church rejected Florence. Even the bishops, when they came back, they rejected the Florence after signing it. They said, oh, this, this council, I don't agree with yeah, a single thing. Right. And as I mentioned before, the Eastern patriarchs, they rejected Florence. And many people like uh, Gemistus Platon, St. Mark of Ephesus, and his, his brother, John, Sylvester Suropoulos, Emirutius, a bunch of people started writing against the Council of Florence and against the Filioque. And to finalize with the Council of Florence, St. Mark of Ephesus himself notes that uh, the Roman Catholic Church is an ecum ecumenist church, that he says that they have two different liturgies, a leavened and an unleavened bread in the Eucharist. They read two different creeds. They have two different baptisms, trying immersion and one uh, uh, baptism with holy, holy chrism, chrism and baptism without, without the holy chrism. chrism. And he says, and he says this, this is not, not a united, united church. church. This is this is yeah, and look at it and now. I mean, we, we've gone from that and that period. All of our saints, all of our doctors continually talking about the innovations and changes in Rome and where it would lead. Here we are five centuries later, and we're absolutely at that point where it's gone into just total chaos. I mean, they're they're putting and they're praying to Pachama idols now. <laughs> what is this goddess woman of the Amazon or whatever that they're praying to that the trads threw into the river like this was some uh, uh, great 
pious, uh, zealous action when uh, you go back to the Renaissance papacy and they've got uh, giant frescoes of ISIS in the in the in the Vatican already. It's been there for centuries. So I don't see anybody uh, storming the Vatican to tear down uh, the images of Tr Hermes Trismegistus and uh, ISIS in the Vatican. No, we don't see that. We just see them freaking out over crap that Taylor Marshall makes a big deal about, as if he's that that important that the Vatican's now editing his Wikipedia to make him look bad. Uh, yeah, right, dude. The uh, Vatican, uh, they have for centuries enjoyed the false trad liberal dialectic within Roman Catholicism. That's why all the way back to the Renaissance, they've been incorporating hermetic ideas. So this faux zeal is nothing but hypocrisy. There, so there you go. There's Isis, Queen of Egypt, with Moses in the Vatican for centuries since the Renaissance. But nobody's ripping this painting off the wall. They're just making some big deal about this, which it is a big deal. I'm not saying that it's not a big deal. It's the fruits of all of this hermeticism and perennialism. I mean, they literally teach perennialism. They, really, they literally argue for classical theism, which is perennialism. And then when we call it out, they act like it's crazy that, that uh, oh, we don't do that. We don't do any of this idolatrous stuff. We don't. It's not idolatry. Uh, yes, it is. We've been saying it's idolatry. And the saints that we're talking about, Mark of Ephesus, these guys, St. Gregor Palamas, right, in this work, this whole work, which is dedicated to debating the Barley Mites, which they think. They literally have the same position as Barlaam. They literally, this is against the Thomistic position. I understand that Barlaam didn't have the exact same positions as Thomas. It doesn't matter because on absolute simplicity, they did. Here's a whole work debating this. And they, they're just like, oh, it's, it can all be reconciled. It can all be reconciled. No, it can't. And, and I have proven that with all these talks. This is why they won't read this book. None of them read this book. None of them read any of the materials that we give them. And they act like, well, you, it's, it's bad translation. It's bad. It's it's you. You're misusing it. Look at this right here. Look at this right here. Okay. This is straight from the debate with the bar. I know we're not going to get into the barley might debate. It's just that this week this has come up. Okay. So this is what Palamas says to barley and the barley mites. And we showed that Gennadio Scalarios says the same thing, too. He condemns uh, Thomism for its absolute divine simplicity doctrine. You give credit to the things that Barlaam expressed, he's debating with the Barlaam, uh, so badly about God and to some others, not all things, uh, for that light which, which came from the Lord that shone upon us. This is where they're debating the uh, light of Tabor. And he says that the council, the, or the Eastern Council, excommunicated publicly and renounce those who taught that the light of Tabor is created. It's not a created light. It's uncreated light. And there's Palamas saying that he accepts, he believes that the Roman Catholic position, the Barlaamite position deserves excommunication. If that's true, then the two positions can't be reconciled. And that's why Palamas was not a saint for centuries and centuries and centuries until the lying ecumenical frauds in the Vatican decided, oh, now he is a saint. And that's because, as David just pointed out, with Florence, as has been the case for a millennia, Rome isn't about what's true. St. Mark of Ephesus is making this point. It's not about what's true. It's about an umbrella submission to bare authority. It's worshiping authority. That's the real God of Roman Catholicism, and that's why the trads act like a bunch of demons. Another note that I would like to make regarding the uh, the statues in the Vatican, I've seen a neo-pagan on Twitter make note of this and say, oh, you're throwing the Pacamama statues, but in the Vatican you have this stuff. And the response, the most popular response was from the Roman Catholic was that this is not inside the altar. Who cares if it's not inside the altar? You're not supposed to have this in the Vatican. Yeah, period. so what? Look. Yeah, look at St. Theodore of Amasia and St. Theodore St uh, Stratilatis. They're both very well known for destroying pagan idols. And did they find those pagan idols inside the church? No, they find them outside the church. Now, granted, they were supposed to, the, the, the Roman military told them that you're supposed to worship these, but the idea still applies. They didn't even want to see them outside of the church. Yeah, it's just the typical them. sophistry. Oh, well, it's not placed inside the North Day. It's not inside the, the sanctuary. Oh, 
Yeah, if it's if it's not, then like it's not inside an Arctic. So what? I mean, it's it's, it's still not it's not in the Arctic. sanctuary, so it's okay. <laughs> you can you can honor it. Uh, I mean, I, th I thought I thought this was a holy place, right? I mean, the whole place is supposed to be decked out with this kind of artwork, but uh, but no, and and, and even still, uh, anybody who's read you know occult Renaissance Church in Rome, they know that it's not just a matter of the artwork. The whole Renaissance papacy, which was uh, promoting, printing, and furthering all of these hermetic and Kabbalistic works, which is total hypocrisy on the part of all these trads who constantly call me a Kabbalist when I have countless lectures critiquing Neoplatonism, Kabbalism, Gnosticism, uh, and their papacy has been uh, uh, in love with Neoplatonism and Kabbalism since the Renaissance. Uh, these trads were reading Hitler's Mein Kampf four years ago, and now they're talking about uh, Catholic integralism in the U.S. I mean, if they if they, if, you, if they apply that sort of critique consistently, then I mean, it's it won't even be a critique. But, but to move, to move on, on with the with the Vering teachings in Florence, there's, there's, there's some, some Vering teachers in Florence that the trads, the trads uh, they, they don't accept. accept. So, so one, one of them is is. is, is um, uh, very, very, very interesting. interesting. One, One of them is about unbaptized babies going to limbo slash hell, and this is in Denzinger 693, which is, which is retracted, retracted by Pope Benedict, Benedict in 2007, by the way. way. But uh, Florence, Florence used, used to teach that unbaptized babies, babies yeah, yeah, they do go to hell. They do end up being condemned and being damned. Yeah. And one other thing that's very in, in, in the, uh, regarding the topic of being damned, uh, there was a Papal Bull of the Union with the Copts in 1442. This is still in Florence, right? It just shows the ecumenistic attitude. Uh, first it was with the Hussites, now it's with the Orthodox, now it's going to be with the Copts. And uh, they made the bull where it says that anyone that circumcises, anyone that is circumcised, loses their eternal salvation. That's literally what the bull says. Yes. It's on Wikipedia, it's everywhere. And... So are all the trads in, in the United States where they all get circumcised, are they all going to hell? <laughs> I mean, they, they should be, according to this canon. If Roman Catholicism is true, then yeah. they should all be going to hell. Let, but, me, uh, let me make a point here. i got a few theological points I want to make because I'm actually I'm going to put this into an article because uh, let's take a mistake from Taylor Marshall that's a good one to illustrate on this point. So, And I'm going to put these links into the discussion for you um inherited guilt all right so this relates to limbo and what uh, david's talking about so taylor marshall for example has this this essay that he did in i don't know some years ago i don't i don't see a date but you can find it it's uh right here and we're, we're highlighting this because taylor marshall uh he's too scared to debate because he knows he would lose a debate um but we can call him out and refute him really easily right here so he has this essay that he did about inherited guilt. Okay, so it's do does original sin equal guilty babies? And you can find that essay at his website. Uh, now, more or less, the position that he outlines is kind of orthodox, to be fair to the guy. Okay, so he, he's not ultimately wrong. Where he's wrong is in his treatment and assessment of Roman Catholic dogma. Uh, I don't think Taylor Marshall appears to have read Denzinger because I knew off the top of my head right away that Denzinger absolutely teaches inherited guilt. Now, again, Taylor Marshall is correct. There is a distinction in Roman Catholic theology and presumably in Orthodox theology as well between what's inherited uh, after Adam and Eve's fall and the actual sins that you and I commit, right? So in Roman Catholic theology, it's it's uh, original sin and then there's actual sin. Actual sin is what you commit with your own will and of your own volition and you know presumably perhaps after an age of accountability or something like this then you're held guilty and accountable but you still have inherited sin now let's look at one of the examples in denzinger uh is this okay that's florence that we'll look at second but here is denzinger 410 now denzinger for some stupid tribe was debating me on uh twitter about this and just totally ignored it so uh, yeah well that doesn't matter no it does matter because denzinger is what are all of the papally approved statements presumably since the time of christ right that's how it's marketed at least up until vatican ii so denzinger 410 says this is going to hit directly on david's point for they assert now this is talking about people that are in error they assert that baptism is conferred uselessly on children this is a group of people who presumably had some kind of 
Pelagian or semi-Pelagian type view in the Roman Catholic perspective. This is not something that Orthodoxy accepts. This this D Denzinger 410 here, this is in the Roman Catholic archives and arcana. Okay, this is their dogma. We respond, this is the Roman Catholic guy, that uh, this is approved by the Pope, that baptism has taken the place of circumcision. Therefore, as the soul of the circumcised did not perish from the people, Genesis 17, 4, so he who has been reborn from water and the Holy Spirit will obtain the entrance to the kingdom of heaven, citing John 3, 5. Although original sin was remitted by the mystery of circumcision, this is one of the key kickers here, because between this uh, document in the 13th century up to the Council of Florence, Roman Catholicism dogmatically will clearly contradict itself right here. Original sin remitted by the mystery of circumcision and the danger of damnation was avoided. So you can have the remission of sins and the avoiding of damnation in the old covenant period through circumcision, according to this stupid argument. Nevertheless, there was no arriving at the kingdom of heaven. So the Roman Catholic view here at this point in its evolution is still saying, yeah, you're, you're barred from kingdom, the kingdom, even if you've been circumcised in the old covenant, because nobody could enter the kingdom of heaven until Christ came and did the work of the cross. Then he opened the kingdom of heaven to the Old Testament saints who, you know, were in Abraham's bosom or Hades or whatever terms you want to use, right? We, we're not trying to, I'm just looking at the Roman Catholic position here. Okay, so let's, we're not going to set aside what orthodoxy says for the moment because we just want to compare these two views within the scheme of Roman Catholicism. So there's no doubt that, the, that this uh, section of Denzinger 410 is clearly saying that you could have original sin's guilt remitted through circumcision and that you could avoid damnation through circumcision but you could not yet enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then it goes on to say, which up unto the death of Christ, it was barred to all people. But through the sacrament of baptism, the guilt uh, uh, of one made red by the blood of Christ is remitted. So baptism goes further. This canon is, this, this uh, section is arguing. And it says that uh, even though a great multitude would die, but, and would perish, but that also for all of these, I got to make this bigger. This is hard to read. There we go. The merciful God who wishes no one to perish has procured some remedy unto salvation as to what the opponents say, namely that faith or love or any of the virtues is not infused into children inasmuch as they do not consent. It is not absolutely granted to most. This is rejecting the, the sort of Pelagian type position that they're, uh, that they're opposing, asserting that by the power of baptism, guilt indeed is remitted to little ones, but grace is not conferred. And some uh, indeed saying that both sin is forgiven and that virtues are infused into them as they hold virtues as a possession, of, not as a function, until they arrive at the age of an adult. We say that a distinction must be made and that sin is twofold, namely original and actual. Original, which is uh, contracted without consent, and actual, which is committed without consent. Original, therefore, which is committed without consent, is remitted without consent to the power of the sacrament. The punishment... The guilt is remitted through the sacrament in the Roman Catholic view in Denzinger 410. By the way, there are other sections of Denzinger which do discuss the inherited guilt. So Taylor Marshall is wrong because there is inherited guilt. The punishment of original sin is the deprivation of the uh, vision of God. This canon goes on to say, the section goes on to say, it's not a canon, it's a specific approval of the, of the Roman papacy. But the punishment of actual sins is the torment of everlasting hell. So the uh, guilt is, there is a punishment, there is a guilt that's inherited, but it doesn't necessarily merit you eternal damnation at this stage in Roman Catholicism. And this is really just uh, echoing Augustine, right? This is the essentially the theological position that Augustine laid down for the necessity of baptism uh, and the remittance of original guilt, you could say. There's also actual guilt, right? Again, this canon is very consistent with the Augustinian position on these issues. Now, let's look at Florence, which says the opposite. Now, it doesn't say the opposite on every point here, but specifically on Old Testament sacraments, as David pointed out, it completely contradicts. 
Florence says, in the fifth place, we have reduced, this is Denzinger 695. In the fifth place, we have reduced this under, I'm going to make this smaller, it's too big. In the fifth place, we have reduced under this very brief formula the truth of the sacraments of the church for the sake of an easier instructions of the Armenians. This is the decree for the Armenians. Uh, present, uh, present as well as the future. There are seven sacraments of the new law, baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, penance, extreme unction, orders, and matrimony, which differ a great deal from the sacraments of the old law. For this, those of the old law did not affect grace, but only pronounced that it should be given through the passion of Christ. The sacraments of ours contain the grace, right? So this is ex opere operato being confirmed, and that the there's no... The, the sins are, cannot, unless you want to say as a Roman Catholic that sins can be remitted without grace, <laughs> which I, would be the most stupid, sophistical thing. That's the only out that I could see a Roman Catholic having. Well, you could have your sins remitted, but there's no grace given. You know, some kind of uh, sophistry that I'm sure they would actually resort to because otherwise they would have to admit that, oh, actually, Denzinger 410 and 695 completely contradict. And actually, Taylor Marshall is completely incorrect. There is inherited guilt. There's multiple places in Denzinger that speak of inherited guilt. So there you go. The sacraments of the Old Testament uh, do not contain the grace. And you get, uh, as David pointed out, you're excommunicated, you're in mortal sin if you get uh, circumcised in the new covenant. Now, of course, the Roman Catholics, well, it's not anybody's fault if you did, you know, if your parents did, it's not your fault. But uh, the, again, the point is that, um, that you can't do this anymore, right? But now the Vatican says after the decrees of uh, Vatican II, oh, actually, the, 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 the Muslims and Jews, all we all worship the same God now. So it does, it's gone way beyond this. Again, who, who's honest can believe that Vatican II is in perfect harmony with Denzinger 695? I mean, come on. Uh, but again, it doesn't even matter because Denzinger 695 is completely contradictory to Denzinger 410 right? Ours contain the grace. You couldn't get the grace under the sacraments of the old law. What does uh, Denzinger 410 say? says that circumcision remitted original sin. Total nonsense. All right. Sorry, David. That was my uh, long rant, but I did want to touch on that because I do think it's a it's something that we notice this week, which is a pretty... I can't see how they could respond to that. The only possible response they could have would be to say that you can have remission of uh, original guilt in the Old Testament without grace, which is retarded. But um, this is also, as you pointed out, attempted to be modified once again in the Vatican's uh, International Theological, the CDS Commission on the Hope of uh, Infants Who Die Without Being Baptized. So now apparently limbo, the limbus infantum, which is in many places uh, dogma in Denzinger, more than one place it's dogma. Oh, now it's uh, it's a theologumina, it's a theological opinion, and you can have hope for the salvation of infants who do not receive water baptism. Totally contradicting the uh documents of Florence and Denzinger 410, as well as many others. So this just shows the papacy is a joke. It does. And I want to add two little things here. One of uh, the first thing I would like to add is, uh, before I forget, is the, the you said, uh, oh, it's not their fault that they get circumcised. Well, obviously, Florence didn't really care because the West knew, they actually knew about the Coptic circumcision thing for a long time during the Crusades. James de Vitry uh, in the 12th century, uh, he will take note of how the Coptic Christians will do circumcision. And there is even a Coptic canon that says uh, circumcision is allowed until you're baptized. So even the church itself said at one period of, in time, uh, the Coptic church, they said that, oh, you can you can circumcise uh, as long until they're baptized. After they're baptized, you can't. But until they're baptized... You can do that. And the circumcision thing, that came with Islam. And that's a con complete con cultural adapta uh, adoption. And it's still prevalent today in the Coptic Church. So uh, that will kind of tie it into the uh, Oriental Orthodox Church. But one other thing that I want to add is that uh, putting all these things into mind, one of the arguments I made, and I believe you also made in uh, several of your videos, is that if the dogma can change, if the dogma can develop, then how can we even be sure that the current dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church are even dogmas? 
I think this is a very legitimate question. And once you realize it with the doctrinal development and this question, you'll, you'll start to understand that not a single dogma is actually a dogma. It is subject to flux. It is subject to change. And this is also another refutation I will use against Roman Catholicism. I think that's what doctrinal development will ultimately lead to. It leads to complete nonsense. What do you think about that? Well, yeah, the whole point of the doctrine, uh, according to Vatican I, was that we were supposed to have a sure guide uh, of the faith uh, for the faithful into what the teaching of Christ is. The office of Peter, the charism of the office of Peter, is what's supposed to give us public certainty about the doctrine, doctrines and about the controversies and disputes. It's the highest level of juridical authority in the church. It's the final say-so. That's This is common sense. Everyone knows this. And it doesn't work. That's the big thing here is that not only does it not work, it's a overstepping of the limitations uh, on the humility that's needed for the servants of Christ. You know, Jesus says to the apostles, he says that you've seen the lords of the Gentiles, how they, you know, they act like they're gods and they lord it over everyone. He says amongst you, it will not be that way. Now, the office of the papacy is way beyond the emperors of the Gentiles. It's like the most... Uh, uh, aggrandized, self-aggrandized, as St. Justin Popovich calls it, humanistic institution out there. In fact, he argues that the humanism of the Renaissance is what gave rise to the humanism of the papacy. Absolutely. Uh, and so that's why it's just this constantly evolving human organism, and it's not a divinely inst uh, instituted organism. At one time, it did participate in the divine organism of the God-man on earth, the body of Christ, the body of the God-man, the God-man body of the church, but it severed itself from that communion, and that's what St. Mark of Ephesus makes very clear in his homilies and in his analysis of the Roman church after Florence. All right, so it will, I think it will, I think we're pretty much done with Florence. That's pretty much all I had to uh, say regarding Florence in that council, and uh, <clears throat> Speaking of the Copt and the Coptic circumcision thing, I think we can move on to Oriental heterodoxy and the theological um, points where we diverge. And some, thing, some certain things that people think that we do diverge, but actually don't diverge. Because, I, as I said, I've seen a couple of people apostatizing to Oriental heterodoxy. I've seen a couple of people just straight up converting to it from atheism to Oriental heterodoxy. And... Uh, I'm pretty familiar with the church. Uh, we have a family friend who's Oriental Orthodox. He's a deacon in the Oriental Orthodox Church in Sweden. So um, I've been to that church. I've, I've, I, know the, I don't know the people, but I know that family. And I, we have very good relations. And uh, he was one of the first people that supported my conversion to Christianity. And to those that don't know, my family is pretty much Muslim. And I'm the only Christian in the family. So it's kind of a different situation here. But... Uh, I'm very aware of the Coptic argumentation. It's something, it's a topic I looked at for, for months very intensely. And it made me, it, it, it was a good, um, it was even a temptation. I was kind of tempted to convert, to apostatize, but it ended up making me uh, find out these new aspects of the faith, made me want to research about the Council of Chalcedon and the writings of St. Kirill, who at this stage, in my view, um, out of all the church fathers, I will say St. Kirill is per probably the best church fathers because when you read the writings that he gives, years beforehand, he will uh, explicate doctrine on several key things okay. such as yeah. the utilitism. I yeah. And he has a direct influence in three different ecumenical councils. He has a direct influence in the Ephesian council. He has a direct influence in the Chalcedonian council. He has a direct influence. Uh, influenced in the Constantinopolitan Council, where his formula was pretty much dogmatized. And he has a lot of influence, actually, in the Diotilite controversy. And uh, that's those are things that we're going to get into. But in regards to Chalcedon, in regards to Oriental heterodox, what is the point, right? What is Miaphysitism, right? We hear that they're called Miaphysites, but a lot of people don't really understand what Miaphysite is. And they seem to, one of the weaknesses that uh, Oriental heterodox really love to abuse is that they'll, uh, they'll look at the under unit, unity of Christ, they'll look at uh, St. Kirill's using the Miaphysis formula, and I say, wait a second, he's using Miaphysis, he's not using Diophysis, but he's our church father, like how is this possible? And this, this issue stems 
first of all, it stems from the word concept fallacy. I had a Twitter debate for four hours with a with a with a Twitter Oriental Orthodox, and throughout the debate, it was a constant usage of the word concept fallacy. He he didn't care about the concept behind it. He just said, "Oh, Calcedon is a false council because it doesn't use the Kirlian concept." And we're gonna Kirlian terminology, and we're gonna get into Calcedon and see that yes, it doesn't use Kirlian terminology, but the concept they're completely Kirlian throughout. And then I think we can talk about uh, Severus of Antioch and uh, Philoxenus of Mavic, the fathers of Oriental heterodox, and see where they diverge and some of the doctrines that we had to deal with, uh, proxy at least, and. One mistake that people make regards Miaphysitism is that I want to emphasize this hard is that Miaphysis, okay, there's an Orthodox Miaphysis and then there's a Heterodox Miaphysis. Yes, exactly. Miaphysis. Thank you. And Heterodox Miaphysis, as a matter of fact, I will say Dioscorus, he didn't use a Heterodox Miaphysis or even Severus, but the first usage of the Heterodox Miaphysis, it was from Apollinarius. Apollinarius was the one who came up with the term. And this is evident from Pseudo-Athanasius. And as a matter of fact, the reason why St. Kirill even uses Miaphysis is because he thought it was from St. Athanasius. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. the concept behind the word that St. Kirill uses is completely orthodox. Now, the concept behind Apollinarius was false because Apollinarius believed that the human soul of Christ was synonymous with the person uh, with the person word, word of god right yeah he put the logos in for the place of uh the human soul the human reasoning faculty right so if if it confuses a faculty with with hypostasis right yeah pretty much and saint kill obviously denies that you know and on the unity of christ and the formula for union throughout all of his writings but what i want to focus on is the mere physics. I don't want to focus on the words itself. I don't care about the words. I want to focus on the idea that St. Kiel was giving. And the idea, if you look at the analogies that he gives, is very clear. St. Kiel is arguing that Christ is composed out of two natures. Not hypostatically, that will be heretical. Because then you will say, well, Christ pre-incarnation is different from Christ post-incarnation. This is not that comp composed. The Composed that we're talking about is about natures just like how us human beings are composed of body and soul Well body soul and spirit, but in the example of Saint Kiel, he says we're composed of body and soul, right? And so when you're when your arm is hurt, you don't say that oh my arm is hurting You don't separate the flesh from the soul you say my arm. I am hurting right you're high you're using the hypostasis as a as a reference point to indicate what's going on Similarly, we are seeing Christ is composed of two natures, but we are not separating them into persons or subjects. That is the mistake that Nestorius did. Even if he did not believe in the two sons theology, he still ended up creating two separate uh, persons or subjects in Christ. And that is what St. Kirill has been dealing for three years. Right. And the idea behind me, I physics, is that Christ is composed of humanity, Christ is composed of divinity, and that's how we will describe Christ, right? That That's how we will say that what Christ is. Now, this is completely orthodox, and this is the mere physics that even heretics like Severus and Dioscorus uses. That's not the problem. The problem with the Oriental Orthodox is not mere physics. We even dogmatize mere physics in the Fifth Council. St. John of Damascus uses mere physics. Yes, yeah, so, so I was going to say, the, the, there's a whole section in the in uh, Exposition of Orthodox Faith where he covers this uh, perfectly. It's not, a, it's not even an issue, really. Yes, yeah, so the, again, the mistake is mere physics versus deophysics. As a matter of fact, people have kind of... I'm not saying, hold on, I'm sorry, because people are going to go shit, ape shit over what I just said. I'm not saying that the Oriental Orthodox are correct. They're not. I'm saying that the terminology is not the problem. The meaning of the terminology is the problem. So uh, don't mistake what I'm saying and go off and lie and start a bunch of controversy because I'm not saying that you can be uh, in these groups... Uh, you have to be orthodox. These groups are not correct in their theology. And the easiest way, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing at all with what David's arguing, but I'm just going to make the point that it, it doesn't become really, there's a reason why the councils progress as they do. And it becomes really clear when you get into two wills and two energies. And when you understand that uh, will and energy are faculties of nature and not hypostasis, and that's when you can understand why there's two wills and two natures in Christ and not one. Or not one composite, blended thing, not one confused thing. Uh, Christ is composite in two natures. Right? His hypostasis is always from all eternity divine. 
Exactly. And I was actually going to get into how Into Nature actually deals with diotelitism because this is incredibly crucial. And first of all, even if in terminology St. Kirill had disputations in regards to Into Nature's, it doesn't matter because he constantly uses the concepts behind as arguments mm -hmm. against the stories. And the formula of Into Nature's, so out of two natures, Mia Physis, what it says is that Christ is composed. Uh, not hypostatically again, but Christ is divine and human, right? And this is united in a single person. What into nature says is that, and this is literally in the Chalcedonian definition, is that Christ is made known into natures, made known to the intellect. This is, this is again, mm -hmm. this is in the Chalcedonian definition. And the important, this is not like the Roman Catholic cope where they say, oh, virtual, this intellectual distinction. No, no, this is actually very important because. How do we know natures? How do we see, well, not see, but how do we know the natures of any person, right? You know that someone is a human being by their human energies, by their human activities. Similarly, the way we know about Christ's divinity and humanity is into natures. How we know that intellectually? Well, it's through the energies. It's through the human energy and it's through the divine energy. And the Council of Chalcedon itself straight up argues for a diotelite notion of Christ, way before the Council itself. And St. Kirill, as I said again, even if he doesn't like the into nature's formula, doesn't matter, but he uses the concept that we use today and we used in Chalcedon as arguments against Nestorius. Here's an example of one of those. He was arguing with Nestorius on exegesis regarding Mark 13, 32. Uh, the whole topic was basically, Nestorius was saying, look, Christ doesn't know the hour of the second coming. He doesn't know it. And so this means that there are two different persons, that there's two different subjects. Right. This vindicates my position. And that's what Saint, uh, that's what uh, Nestorius says. And Saint Kirill replies and said, "No, Nestorius, that's not that's not how it is." He explains in his own uh, view how it is possible, and he says that Christ, when he adopts humanity as a single person, when he adopts humanity. He inherits everything humanity. He inherits the limitations of humanity. Of humanity. Mm -hmm. But does that mean that he's absolutely limited? No. So there's no absolute limitations, but he still inherits the limitations of humanity. And here's, a, here's an example that I kind of came up with. Let's say that Christ is walking on the desert and he's going to go to a town five miles away, right? Uh, let's say that he walks for an hour. And after an hour, he says, oh, I wonder, you know, how long it is, like how, how long it, it's going to take more. Well, he doesn't have a Google Maps brain uh, in his hu in in uh, in his human. He doesn't. He limits himself to not know, in order to you be with us in our uh, in our struggles in human human struggles. But again, these are not absolute limitations. These are the limitations that he himself adopted in his humanity, and so he does know the hour. Right. But he gave a human-centered answer in Mark thirteen thirty-two. And the way he gives a human-centered answer, how is that possible? By using his human... Well, hold on. So, yeah, so so that's correct. Um, roughly speaking, the one thing I would qualify is, is that I would say that the there is a, a growth and a, and a change in the human nature of Christ, and the human nature of Christ includes everything that is proper to human nature, right? So there's no created hypostasis in Christ. There's no created human... Um, uh, uh, person in Christ, there's only a fully human nature. And so the faculties of nature are all there. There's will, there's soul, there's intellect, there's uh, body, um, there's human energy, but there's absolutely no human hypostasis at all. However, the humanity has for its personal subject, for its hypostasis, the eternal person of the word. And that's why we always say that he's only in terms of his hypostasis, a divine person. There's no created human hypostasis in Christ at all. There is a fully human nature. This is the whole basis of the nature-person distinction. So, a lot of the times, the fathers, when they explain the text where we do have Christ undergoing limitations, it's because he did it out of, uh, he did these, he did, in a sense, limit himself willfully, right? Like, Christ is everywhere, but he also uh, willed to be at a specific point in space and time, uh, in terms of his right personhood, right, the, Jesus really was walking around the wedding at Cana, right, at the same time as he was everywhere, because he's a divine person. 
so he can do this. Uh, John Damascus explains this very eloquently when he talks about the descent into Hades, that even when the uh, human soul of Christ was rendered from his bo- rent, rended from his, rent from his body in the death, the deified human soul descended into Hades, and even then it was never separated from the its hypostasis of the word, right? So the even when he had descended into Hades in his human soul, it was still the only divine person present there is the Logos. That's it. No other personhood, no other persona, no other subject. Um, this debate gets really clear by the time of St. Maximus when they debate the issue of gnomic will. And this is where we can explain even further what David's talking about in the topic of Christ's human passions. Now, this is uh, Ad Thalassium 21. If you read St. Maximus's Ad Thalassium 21, he talks about why Christ possesses no gnomic will. And that's because the humanity that he assumed, uh, as he says on page 111, is from the Virgin Mary, and it's like the humanity of Adam. So he didn't inherit ancestral sin. But you're going to say, wait a minute, if he didn't inherit ancestral sin, then why did he suffer? Because he willed to suffer. He willingly underwent the suffering in his humanity. But he did not have human deliberation. This is why he possesses no gnomic will, because the only subject present there for all of the incarnate actions of Christ is the Logos. If Christ was a created hypostasis, if he possessed human deliberation, he would possess a gnomic will. But this proves that there's no created hypostasis in Christ, because he has no deliberative will. He doesn't fluctuate based on his circumstances. And so this gets into the exegesis of the passage in the garden. My God, uh, my God, or uh, when he says, uh, let this cut pass from me, excuse me. And so Maximus argues that it's a blameless passion. Christ inherited our blameless passions, which are a result of the fall, but he did not inherit the ancestral sin of Adam because he assumed human nature uh, like it was in the state of Eden. That's why he's the new Adam. That's why Mary has the position of being Theotokos. So um, that's why the Sixth Council and the Confession of St. Sophronius and elsewhere essentially confirmed Maximus's argument that Christ does not possess a gnomic will. There's no deliberation in Christ, and that means that we do not exegete that passage as if Christ didn't know the time of his coming. In fact, he says everything that the Father possesses, the Son has. But the, the Father communicates and gives that power and that knowledge and those attributes to the Son. So Jesus can say, I do nothing of my own will, but what the Father sends me to do, right? Because everything that he has is given to him from the Father. All the power, all the uh, uh, divine attributes are transmitted, communicated from the Father to him. So that's how we understand all those texts where Jesus says that. But the gnomic will is huge because if you don't understand this issue, you will fall into Christological errors. I myself, David has done some great videos where he's talked about Early on, you may, you'll make mistakes when you get into Orthodox theology, and the key is to have the humility to be corrected. I was wrong. I, at one time, I thought that Christ, although I understood that he didn't possess a gnomic will, I thought, well, he still had to have fallen human nature or else it couldn't be restored. But I didn't understand at the last 20, uh, 21. Then I read at the last 21. I read uh, other of Maximus's discourses, and I saw where I was wrong because he, in fact, does uh, inherit excuse me, he does uh, assume the the humanity of Adam like it was in the garden, and that's why he doesn't possess ancestral sin. So we have to be very precise and very, very careful there about orthodox theology. But all of the stuff that we're talking about right now completely refutes the um, monophysite, the monenergist positions, the monothelite positions, and that's what we're going to get into next. Um, Anyway, I I didn't mean to cut you. I'm not going to, we'll do eventually a whole talk on this, but again, if you have if you have this one, I mean, I have all the works of Maximus in English, but if you have this one, you can just open up to page uh, 109, and there's a whole uh, question at the last in 21 on in what sense Christ had blameless passions but did not possess uh, ancestral sin, right? And James talks about this in his epistle when he says that uh, human desires, the passions, he says they're not inherently uh, sinful until we consent to them. So Christ willed to undergo things like death, to undergo uh, hunger, thirst, pain in this life, 
uh, not because it was taken from him, but as he says to Pilate, I lay my, my life down willfully. He says, you would have no power against me unless it were given to you from heaven. So anyway, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. I will agree. And I mean, the fact that St. Kirill says uh, there is no absolute limitation also proves that he's arguing against Nomic Will as well. So he, he himself doesn't even believe in Nomic Will, even if, again, even if the word itself wasn't relevant in the discussions. That well, Nomic Will is a good example of something that um, is a precise idea that comes up later. So just because the, there's not the terminology, no, there's nobody said no McWill, you know, in the first century, therefore it's an invention and an innovation. It's a, it's a term that's used to explicate the true idea. That's why we don't fall into the word concept fallacy. We have to understand these terminology, the terminologies as they're used in the patristic era, right? You can't just assume that there's one definitional sense to all these terms and that they aren't conditioned by the systems that they come from. Pretty much. And uh, in regards to moving on to Kalkadon, uh, the, the reason why into nature's aspect is very important, uh, if you're talking about you know the Kalkadonian controversy and uh, Severus, is that they will say, okay, Miaphysite, that's okay, you, you're supposed to be Miaphysite, but then... The problem with the Oriental heterodox is not the Miaphysitism, it's the rejection of Diophysitism. And when you miss out the Diophysis, as I mentioned before, you miss out on the on the do on the natural properties of Christ. Those properties of the nature being energies, wills, right? And so if you miss out the into nature as well, how do you get the diotelitism? How do you get dioenergism? You don't get it. And that's why when you read the writings of Severus of Antioch, he's pretty much trying to juggle and make sense between them, but he's he has an overemphasis on the Tiandric will and the Tiandric energy, and he pretty much doesn't care about the uh, the diotelite factor, factor, and that's why we even say that he's a monoenergist, mono because he doesn't emphasize the dioenergist uh, part, because he rejects into natures, and that's what it leads to. Now, in terms of Kalkadon, one of the criticisms of Kalkadon, I want to get down to the criticisms, is that one criticism is that it rehabilitates uh, Nestorians, right? You, Theodoret of Cyrus and Ibas are two examples. These people are Nestorians and Kalkadon rehabilitate them. What's up with that? Well, the first thing I will say in regards to Theodoret of Cyrus is that I will tell them to read Eranistus, uh, a work by Theodoret of Cyrus. In 447, uh, four years before Chalcedon, Theodoret of Cyrus actually uses Kyrillian terminology, Kyrillian argumentation, to prove that Christ is a single hypostasis, a single person. Uh, so Theodoret, four years before, even though he has a very Nestorian, like, he had a lot of fights with St. Kyrill, I don't dispute any of that. He had a lot of disagreements and, and, and a bunch of that stuff, but... Theodoret eventually comes to accept St. Kirill's position. And that's the difference between, one of the differences I will say between us and Oriental Orthodox is that we rehabilitate people. The Oriental heterodox, I mean, did you see what happened in 449? They, after the council, they killed St. Flavian, mm -hmm. they injured Ibas, Ibas and uh, Dioscorus, when St. Kirill died, hunted his family. So there's a complete different view of rehabilitation between the OOs and us. And Again, Ephesus, uh, the Second Council of Ephesus, that's one of the reasons why Pope St. Leo looked at the Ephesian Council and said, what's going on over here? This, this is a huge issue. And he called it the Robert Council, the Council of Dens, because there was a lot of vices in procedure. Just like how the Council of Florence had vices in procedure, so that the Second Ephesian Council had a lot of vices in procedure. And it's also, and it's, I mean, this argument is also very weak because they rehabilitated a complete monophysite, Eutychius. Eutychius was an absolute monophysite, and they rehabilitated him. And another person that got rehabilitated was Ibas, which St. Justinian, this is from my friend Jay to Nick, St. Justinian apparently says that the the arguments from Ibas, the latter arguments where he claimed that St. Kirill was a heretic, turned out to be forgeries. Uh, so... There's not much ground there either. And both of them, both ex uh, anatomized Nestorius and his theology, and they accepted Kyrillianism. So there's a distinction between us Orthodox and the O's. And I'm not saying that the Oriental Orthodox, that they're evil people or whatever. I'm just saying that the difference between us is that we rehabilitate people. We turn Nestorians into Kyrillians. The Oriental Orthodox turns Diophysites into dead bodies. They straight up kill them. They don't even care to argue with them. And that's actually one of the other reasons why the Church of the East, uh, the Persian uh, part where 
Saint Isaac the Syrian was a part of. He, uh, his church wanted to be part of the Orthodox Church, but they were pressurized by the Monophysites. They were pressurized by the Oriental Orthodox, and they ended up having to adopt Nestorianism. They ended up having to go away from Chalcedon, which is again another. Uh, it's another thing that shows the difference in rehabilitation, and I think this is very crucial. Another uh, criticism of Chalcedon is its rejections of Kyrillian formula, which we've already dealt with. I mean, first of all, it uses Kyrillian terminology. It uses Kyrillian adverbs in, uh, in, its, in its Chalcedonian definition, in its symbol of fate. It uses like four out of three uh, Kyrillian adverbs, and the idea behind is very Kyrillian. And another criticism is that it only uses in two natures. It used the Nestorian uh, definitions. But as I mentioned before, that criticism falls flat on its face because Chalcedon itself says that the two natures, the, uh, the two natures in Christ, we, uh, Christ is made known in two natures according to the intellect. So not even in your own form is this used in Chalcedon. It's actually used in Kyrillian form. And so... The Kyrillian, uh, the Chalcedonian council is very Kyrillian, and if you read, and this is in your recommended le reading list, by the way, I completely recommend everyone reading this. If you read Father John McGuckin's book on St. Kirill of Alexandria and the Christological Controversy, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about is already dealt there, and that book is, it teach, it tells you a lot about Chalcedon, it teaches you a lot about the Council of Ephesus and Nestorius and what he believed and St. Kirill and what he believes. And it will clear out all issues you have regarding the Oriental Orthodox because it completely decimates all of the Oriental Orthodox criticisms. And by the way, these criticisms, these are not by random people online. These are criticisms that were made by people like Dioscorus himself, people like Severus. It's their criticisms, but these criticisms are actually pretty simple. It's very simple to uh, show where they're wrong at. And and I'm ready to talk about... And one proof that Chalcedon is Kyrillian and that... that uh, so you see, Jay, you see this um, view of Chalcedon in the West, for example, that Chalcedon is all Leo, right? It's all Saint Leo. Uh, it's just a bunch of stupid Eastern uh, bishops discussing about stuff. And then Pope St. Leo came, gave the tome, and dealt with the council. Rome spoke, the problem is solved. That's basically the, the advertisement of the Chalcedonian council. But there are a lot of issues with that because, first of all, Tome of Leo was actually disputed quite heavily. Uh, Illyrian bishops and Palestinian bishops in the council said, this is Nestoria. They straight up said, this is very worrying because this is sounding a lot like Nestorius. This is not sounding like Kirill. And the council spent five days, and I'm not kidding you, they spent five days looking into what St. Kirill says. They cross-referenced the things that St. Kirill says with the Tome of Leo. And after five days, they came to the conclusion, oh, this is indeed orthodox, right? And so, yes, they, they say that Peter spoke through Leo, but how did they came to that conclusion? Well, it took them five days. Five whole days, that's a lot of days. In a yeah, shouldn't they have just said whatever he says is, uh, yeah, I mean, they're, why is there cross-referencing if this is the, uh, you know, Vatican I view? This is, that's just, they just, they're just dis dishonest about that part. Yes, and Oriental Orthodox are very dishonest because they, they look at this Roman Catholic tale and completely run with it and use it as a justification to, uh, to go against Chalcedon, and nothing like that happened. No, Chalcedon, as far as the orthodoxy of Chalcedon is concerned, the basis, the standard of Chalcedon is St. Kirill. Even though in language it might not at first sight seem to be, when you look at the concepts behind the Chalcedonian definitions and the declarations, it is completely Kirillian. And when I tried to push that point to the, the trad o -O -T yesterday, he didn't even address that. They, they straight up... Uh, close their own ears off and go, went, la, 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 I'm not hearing you. And then just like went Marco Rubio mode and repeating the same talking points that, that was already dealt with. And so Chalcedon, the way we need to view Chalcedon as, as uh, Orthodox Christians is very important because if you have a wrong view of Chalcedon, eventually if you meet an trad OO trying to argue against you, well, you, you, you're, going to be, you're going to get tempted because it is a pretty harsh uh, council to deal with. And another thing to realize with the council, the political aspect of the council, uh, 
is simply that the emperor, I believe Marcion, Marcion wanted the council to be done with quick, right? He wanted things to be done with quickly. So the symbol of fate even, uh, the reason why it doesn't use a Kirillian uh, formula is because at the first session, it was vetoed by, by the Palestinians, no, the Syrians, I think, and they didn't have enough time to debate on it. And so they had to reach a compromise where they kind of used the Syrian term but, but they changed the term in such a way that it's actually apophatically speaking Kirillian, right? <laughs> because if it, if it says into natures is made known to the intellect, then what's next? The, what's left? The Kirillian formula. And that was apophatically in a way accepted. And that's what happened in the fifth council is that it was pretty much dogmatized in your face. But even in Kalkadon, Kirill's ideas were pretty much adopted. Now, why did I even talk about this? Because this is very important in realizing the natures of Christ and how this comes to deal with the energies and the wills of Christ is very important. Um, one mistake that Severus of Antioch makes is that he confuses nature and hypostasis. And this is noted also in... Uh, this is, this is the mistake of all heretics. <laughs> exactly. exactly, as St. John of Damascus says. And uh, Joseph Farrell is very great in his critique of uh, the Oriental heretics because he goes way into detail uh, regarding where they go wrong and what they teach. And so the first, right off the bat, uh, Severus interprets the body and soul analogy as both of them being hypostasis, right? So the body is a is a uh, was well, the body is a non self subsistent hypostasis, meaning that it does not exist on its own. The soul is a self-subsistent hypostasis. It exists on its own. Uh, it exists independently. It can it can exist independently of the body. And so the human hypostasis is a is a composite uh, non uh, com composite hypostasis, right? And similarly, uh, he says that the humanity of Christ is a non self-subsistent -subsist hypostasis. The divinity is a self-subsistent hypostasis. And so he says that the hypostasis is composite. This is one of the first, this is completely contradictory with the first Ephesian council. You can't say that the hypostasis is composite because as, as you mentioned in your, in your, in your monologue in a way, uh, you're completely right. If you say the uh, hypostasis is composite, then you arrive to the heresy. In a way, you arrive to the heresy of Nestorianism. Right. And that term is used in uh, John Damascus and St. Maximus, but it's been misunderstood by certain people. And uh, there's a, uh, an essay by Madden who covers it. Um, this actual mistake is covered very well. I mean, it's not a mistake because the term itself is not a problem. You can say that Christ's hypostasis is composite, but it depends on what you mean. Like the hypostasis itself isn't composite, but if you mean that it's composite and that he assumed a human nature, then yes, right? So it's also a misunderstanding of inhypostatized. It's dealt with very well in Byzantine Christ by Demetrios Batherelos. Um, there's another book I would recommend that deals with this topic, which is the Orthodox Person in the Orthodox uh, Person in the Orthodox Tradition by uh, Metropolitan Herothius. Um, those are two good ones. There's also, if you want to go back a little older, uh, the concept of uh, divine persons by Ter Terchescu uh, and Gregory of Nyssa. So, and yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that these are a little bit expensive, but uh, my boys in the Discord, we have a, a way of uh, getting people some texts if they, you know, we can, we can help you out and maybe try to get these texts to you, perhaps. Um, but it depends on what, this is a, the word concept fallacy again, it depends on what we mean by composite hypostasis. It doesn't mean that Christ's hypostasis itself undergoes an alteration in terms of itself. It does mean that Christ, as a divine hypostasis, possessing a fully divine nature, assumed a human nature. And so that's what composite hypostasis means. So there's a uh, Christology of uh, asymmetry and a Christology of symmetry. And this is, we've already had a huge debate over this this year, and I'm correct. Uh, not just me, but all the people on our side are correct on this issue. I wrote a whole giant long essay about this, which can be read at Jay's analysis if you want to look up. What, is, what does composite hypostasis mean? And as David's pointing out, it's not, um, it's not about the terms. I mean, I'm not saying terms and words don't matter. They do matter. But what matters ultimately is what we mean by the terms and the words. That's the word concept fallacy. And so if you don't understand 
what hypostasis means if you just think it's an individual or or uh, an, an instance of an individual or a concretization of, of, of a person or a nature or whatever, you're going to mess up because we need to start with our basics. What is nature? Nature answers the question of what, what's happening, what's going on, what's doing that thing. <laughs> Hypostasis or person answers the question of who. Nature and person are distinct. This is fundamental to the theology of orthodoxy and John Damascus. It's fundamental to how you do Trinitarian theology to avoid modalism. Will or volition, this is what we mean by choice, right? Free will. When will moves, it moves according to energy or action, right? And energy and action and will are proper to nature. They're faculties of nature. They're not faculties of person or hypostasis, right? Telos is the question of purpose. Why we, what motivates us to do the actions that we do? RK, principle, right? These are just common terms in patristic theology that one should be familiar with. Logos. The Logos is an eternal divine person, the second person of the Godhead who enters into time and space in the incarnation in a human nature. Fully human nature, united to all universal human nature in his singular divine hypostasis. He possesses a fully human... There's nothing lacking in his humanity, but the humanity that he possesses does not have a hypostasis of its own that's created. It's only hypostasis, its only subject, is the eternal divine person of the Logos. And this is the entire debate between Cyril and Nestorius. Now, after Ephesus, there's two more councils that debate this topic, and it moves out, as Dave is pointing about, out. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to get too far ahead if you have more on Chalcedon. I'm not trying to get ahead of you, but I just want to point out that the debate moves on to the to the question of wills and energies and what is will and energy a faculty of? Is it a faculty of person or a faculty of nature? And that's really the the root of the dispute between us and all of the Orientals. Yes, I, as I was pretty much getting to that part, one very small important thing that I would like to add regarding the into nature thing is that. Um, there are many fathers that use the into nature's formula. I mean, first of all, Saint Kirill in the formula of reunion, he's, right. he doesn't have a problem with into nature's if it's understood correctly. And Cal Calcedon understands, understands it correctly. And that's and why we right. don't haggle over the terms, but over the meaning. This is so key. Exactly. Exactly. This is what everybody has a problem with. Exactly. And as you said, yeah, words and concepts, they do matter, but the con you need to look at the concept behind the word. Anyways, um, there are many different church fathers, St. Gregory the Theologian, St. Ambrose, St. Gregory of Nyssa, that use the into nature's formula as well. So this is not something a new, it's not a new creation in the Antiochian school of Christology. This is something that has been um, for a while. And when, when Severus of Antioch, the father of Oriental heterodoxy, when he sees this, he says that... Uh, he basically says that, yes, there are church fathers that use the into nature's formula. Don't listen to them. <laughs> it, it, he, he straight up said they're wrong, but, you know, I'm not... Uh, he, he, he selects certain fathers that says they're wrong in that ma matter and just ignores them. And he says, no, you don't listen to what they say. Listen to what I have to say regarding into nature's. And so he, this is his way of coping with the fact that the church fathers are fine with both in two natures and out of two natures formula. And that's what orthodoxy uh, yes, uh, points exactly. out. And in the, in the fifth council, in the sixth council, and all around, uh, the importance of both of those, both diophysitism and meophysitism, the importance of adopting both of them shows, it shows itself. And, and uh, if, you if you move on, on to the bills, bills in, uh, in, uh, to what uh, Severus, Severus thinks, Severus, Severus looks, looks at a quote from, from St. Dionysius, the Areopagite, uh, St. Uh, Dionysius. And St. Dionysius, he says that, uh, uh, he says, but when God, God became human, he performed for us a new divine, divine human, meaning tiandric activity. As, uh, as, uh, and, and Severus, Severus interprets, interprets the passage as saying, as saying he, he, he says, says that there's a one composite, composite activity in our, in our eyes, it cannot, it cannot be understood, understood other than as a rejection of every duality. 
And so Severus is pretty much rejecting, is on record rejecting diotelitism. And why is that the case? Because as you said before, Severus thinks that the rootedness of energy, the rootedness of will, is in the hypostasis. How many hypostases does Christ have? Well, Severus will say only one. Therefore, there's only one, and that's Tiandric. There's only the Tiandric energy and Tiandric will, but there's no, you know, there's no divine will. There's no human will. And not only he, but the rest it's of a divino the human Orthodox mix, world. right? Yeah, this is so. If you yes. if you read uh, uh, book three of John Damascus, chapters eighteen and nineteen, he gives his exposition of the new theandric activity, and this is pointing out that uh, before the incarnation, there was God and there was man. Uh, God acted in the world in various ways. God became. Uh, present in the theophanies but after the incarnation there's a new theandric activity and that's because there's now a uh, divino divino human person right uh and that humanity is i'm not saying there's a created hypostasis there's not but he is the god man right he does possess a fully human nature and so because he possesses a fully human nature and he moves and acts through both of these natures in his singular divine hypostasis we can speak of a new the and god man theandric a new theandric activity in the earth that's exactly it's not that confusing it's not that crazy that's exactly how john of damascus exposits this in chapters 18 and 19 um and then he goes on to talk about how there's no uh no mcwill in the next section chapter 20 um, and he talks about christ's human operations being deified by the uncreated energies at the end of chapter 19. this is all very clear it's all very consistent it's all very orthodox and by the way i would add too there's another work that i've gotten a hold of that was very influential throughout this time period so basically as david's pointing out after chalcedon you have a series of a few centuries of debates over this question of well what about chalcedon what about the tome of leo um and as mcguckin points out it's not until 553 this is page 242 of his book it's not until 553 a.d uh, essentially, that the neo kyrillic interpretation is vindicated. But the Fifth and the Sixth Councils completely vindicate what eventually becomes called the neo kyrillian the neo kyrillic interpretation of Chalcedon and the Tome. This is very key. So this is why you can't just like pick out a single council or a single period and say, oh, uh, uh, this is where everything is you know, the de the debating point, and then after that, everything else is wrong. This is what a, lot, a mistake a lot of people do when they're trying to look at orthodoxy, and they don't understand that there's a development, not of doctrine, but of the understanding and exposition and explication and precision of exactly what's being being pointed out here. Again, that's why the Bathrellos book, if you really want to understand this stuff, the Bathrellos book is really key because he talks about the neo kyrillic development after Chalcedon. And how, and as McGuckin does, and how that view is what's vindicated. There's not, you can't go back and say, oh, well, there's actually supposed to be some kind of uh, um, like pseudo Nestorian view that we're supposed to vindicate. No, it's Cyril that's vindicated. And it's Cyril that's vindicated at the Fifth Council and at the Sixth Council. Uh, and it's not about monophysitism, that's rejected. It's about the two wills and the two natures and whether will and energy are faculties of nature and person. That's the whole debate. That's why when you get to Maximus debating with Pyrrhus, that's the whole debate in the Maximus in the debate with Maximus and Pyrrhus. And he argues that, look, the energies in Christ's human nature are distinct from the energies in his uh, a pro a proper to his divine nature. And therefore, there's two wills and two energies in Christ and that the uncreated divine energies deify the created human energies and created human will. And again, the, the works of Leontius of Byzantium, they were very influential throughout this period in arguing for and vindicating diophysitism and diotheletism. Yeah, and I will also like to um, uh, mention, dang, what was I going to mention? One thing I was also going to mention, aside from that, is I kind of missed out on that, but... There's a funny way how uh, Kyrillian uh, Christology also supports essence energy's distinction. Now, I know that St. Kyrill himself does state that uh, nature and energies are not the same thing. So he already supports the essence energy's distinction. But for St. Kyrill, he says uh, the argument he makes is that there's a distinction of natures, but the distinction of natures does not imply separation, composition, or division. And so I yeah. would say that this is a very good apologetic that... Uh, 
not all yeah, distinct. Yeah, this, yeah, this distinction does not imply division. There's a distinction in natures of Christ, but this doesn't mean that there's a division in Christ. And so in the Roman Catholic view, they will have to completely adopt the Severan view, which in a way kind of has that view. I've seen I've seen some Severans, some uh, Oriental heterodox say that uh, they believe in the essence and energy distinction, but then I've seen some other people say that, that the distinction is only in our mind, which is a Roman Catholic position. So I'm not, I'm kind of confused where they're going with this. But another aspect, one of the reasons why I will say they're called monophysites is because of the theandric uh, will, uh, like their overemphasis on one will, uh, their overemphasis monoenergism. Mono because as I said before, how do we know the natures? We know the natures through the energies, right? And so if there's only one uh, energy, and Severus is on record of saying that there's only one energy, well, that seems to be mono, uh, monophysitism, and that's one of the one of the things that led us to refer to them as monophysites because it does lead to monophysitism. Even if they reject Eutychianism, which is OG monophysitism, it doesn't matter because your theology leads to monophysitism. You literally yourself say that Christ is a single hypostasis, and that the that the wills that the energies of Christ that the theandric aspect of those energies and wills reject all sorts of duality, if that is the case, then how are you not monophysites, right? And another aspect of the wills, it's Severus's view on wills is kind of confusing, and um, uh, Joseph Fer uh, Farrell himself goes into this, and he talks about the planes of reality. For Severus, there's three planes of reality. There's the Trinitarian reality, there's the angelic reality, and then there's the material, you know, our reality. And Farrell notes that if that is the case, then you have the human will of Christ, right? That human will is, uh, it's on the material reality, and that the divine will is in, uh, it's in the Trinitarian plane. And so there's a difference of planes. So they're ontologically different. And because they're uh, because the divine will is then so ontologically superior and on a different plane, that means that one of them has to subjugate the other. And it, according to that logic, that will mean that the divine will is completely subjugating the human will outside of the outside of the free will. So uh, that is how it will lead to monotheism. It's just a divine yeah. will. The human will is completely subjugated and subordinated in Severan metaphysics. Even if he doesn't think that, even if he says, oh, no, I don't think that's how it works, that's not the issue because that's what your theology leads to. Right, it should lead to that, right, exactly. Yeah, it's... Mm -hmm. And uh, he has a lot of different views in regards to how... He also says how the, uh, I think... Uh, that the human will is an iconic representation of the divine will, which is another aspect of how it leads to that sort of a notion. And so there's a completely, you know, Severus, even if he himself won't call himself a mana energist, he will probably call himself a mia energist, most likely. His theology leads to mana energism. And Severus, you know, he's one of the better fathers, right? He's one of the more like, he's one of the fathers that you can stand because a lot of, you know, there are parts where he is correct. That's not the point. There are parts where he contradicts himself. And another, another, um, another father that I would like to uh, emphasize on uh, in in this discussion is Philoxenus of Mabok and his view on, his view on Christology. Well, before, before you do before, that, well, before you do that, say, yeah. let me let me make a point here just for the sake of the audience, so that we remind right, people right, where right. where we are. So we we went through some of these terms right before this. I did. Um, henosis or henotic union. That's Cyril's idea that there's an analogy between the union of body and soul in a human being and the type of union that exists in Christ between the divine and the human. So he says that that union, it's you can still make a distinction between the divine and the human, but there's the union is so strong that it's almost like the way that the soul is, uh, you know, equally dispersed throughout fully the human body. So that's his term, henosis and the henotic union, as an analogy for the way that the divine and human natures exist in Christ. And it's a great analogy. But again, it's just an analogy, so it's not a one-to-one. -one. So in the same way, uh, Cyril is very famous for the, for the idea of inhypostatize. And this is the idea that nature, whether divine or human, only exists in the tropos or mode of individual hypostases or persons. 
So I am this particular person, Jay. You're the particular person, David. We both share a common human nature, but what we do is that we instantiate that human nature, in particular, individual concretizations as the person, Jay, and as the person, David. Hypostasis is not just an instance of nature. It is an instance of nature, but it's not just an instance of nature. It also goes higher or transcends that, and that's why we're not modalists when we apply that same idea to the Trinity, which is that each of those hypostases instantiates the divine nature, but they really are distinct from one another, and they really do possess unique hypostatic properties. The Son really is a Son. He's not just an instance of the divine nature and the spirit, an instance of the divine nature, a mask, right? Sabellianism. But they actually, uh, you could you could look at person as transcending nature. It's something mysterious. It doesn't mean that we can't say things about it, but as the fathers say, I think as Gregory of Nyssa says in um, the concept of the divine persons, Nyssa says that even hypostasis is mysterious to us. It can't be perfectly defined, nor can usia. I mean, we can give these kind of linguistic limitations to these terms, but we don't exactly know what it is to be a hypostasis. We don't exactly know what the, Paul says. What, what does a man know his own spirit? No, yeah, only the spirit of God knows what is in a man and the spirit of a man. So even to ourselves, we are, are mysterious to ourselves. How much more is, you know, what it is to be hypostasis and God mysterious to us. But I mean, that's covered very well in a lot of these works. So uh, I just get tired of re- really rehashing the same things over and over and over. Because, I mean, if you just get this main point here, and if you understand that the Father eternally begets a Son, who is really a Son, and that when we're pr- participating in salvation, we're participating in a real filial relationship. We're not just being given uh, a divine essence. We're not just being given a divine energy. We're being given as Palamas says in hypostatized divine energy. That means that all the energies are personal They're hypostatic. They're in hypostatized because the energies are proper to nature. So in the same way, uh, it applies to humans. It applies to us. And I want to real quick before David goes into Mabug, we want to look at the, the way that John Damascus defines energy and the distinctions here, which he says are all distinct. You'll, you'll find that it's exactly what I was just telling you. Energy and capacity for energy and the product of energy and the agent are all different. Energy is the efficient and essential activity of nature, right? So energy is a faculty or, or a, a product of, it's a proper to nature, we should say. The capacity for energy is the nature from which proceeds that energy. The product of the energy, the effect, is that which is affected by the energy. The agent is the person or the hypostasis who acts. This is very simple. It's very consistent. It's consistent across the board. So if we keep that in mind, all of these terms start to make sense. Now, it's a little bit of a, dis- it's, it's distinct in the Trinity because the Trinity is tri-hypostatic. It's not just one hypostasis, Father, Son, and Spirit in one singular shared divine usia or essence. So it's distinct from humans. But when it comes to hypostatic acting, personal acting, even though the mode is triadic, it's still the same. The energies are, God's actions are distinct from the hypostases. The divine essence is distinct from the, the hypostases so that you can have three persons. If it's not, you couldn't have three persons. That doesn't mean that there's some mysterious essence floating out there. It means that the essence of God is always in hypostatized. If any of the heretics would just learn these terms and what they mean in our system, you can't import Hellenic definitions. They would be on our side. And speaking of the Hellenic definitions, it's pretty clear that uh, Severus and many other Oriental uh, fathers are pretty much riddled in the Hellenic definitions. I mean, a simple example is this confusion of nature. And nature. This That's, is what Maximus argues. Maximus yeah, argues yeah. that not only John Damascus, but Maximus says to Pyrrhus that you're caught up in Hellenic dialectics. He says it in the disputation many times. Yeah, so to get to Philoxenus of Mavok, there's one thing I want to note regarding him. It's pretty interesting. Uh, he has a very weird Eucharistic theology uh, and Christology. So his Christology, his view of Christology, lead him to say that the Eucharist is, to the eyes of the faithful, the Eucharist is body and blood of Christ, right? But 
without the eyes of the faithful. So if you don't have faith, what you're eating is not the body and blood of Christ, but actually it's just normal bread and wine. So he this comes from his Christological view, where he views the, the Eucharist is a miracle in this view, right? And so Christology, the humanity of Christ in his view is also uh, a miracle, right? And just like how there's an eye, eye of faith sort of relativism there, the relativism is still in there. So if you to the eyes of the faithful, Christ is divine and human. To the eyes of the unfaithful, I guess that will mean that's just God. But uh, it's really interesting to note, and uh, Farrell himself notes that uh, while obviously Philoxenus won't, he will say, oh, no, that's not what I'm saying. But it seems to me that it seems completely ne unnecessary to even make that sort of an argument, sort of a Eucharistic argument, a Christological argument to say that Christ's human nature is a miracle, uh, which also, you know, pushes away the Theotokos aspect of it. It's, it's just a mere miracle. It's not the cooperation of the mother of God as well. It's, it's a miracle of God purely uh, in, in that aspect. And it's very, it's, as I said, it's strange. I mean, that Eucharistic theology itself is, I will say, doesn't make any sense. If you don't have faith and if you're taking part of the Eucharist, you're being condemned. You're drinking condemnation to yourself. So if it's just bread and wine, then there is no condemnation. Best case scenario, you get the body and blood of Christ. Worst case scenario, it's just bread and wine. And this Eucharistic theology is not compatible with Orthodox Eucharistic theology. I will say it's not, com uh, it's not compatible with pre-Chalcedonian and post-Chalcedonian Orthodox. It's, it's something that's completely a new innovation of Philoxenus' mind. And I will say it's, it's, it's one of the other critiques I will give to uh, Oriental heterodox. Another saint in the Orient Oriental Orthodox Church, which is the father of monoenergism, mono mono is Pope Theodosius. Pope Theodosius, uh, Kirill Hoveron himself writes this, and John of Ephesus uh, wrote that Severus, Theodosius, and Antimus are the fathers of monotheism. John of Ephesus himself is or is in the Oriental Orthodox Church, I believe. He was he was a historian in that church. So he himself says that Severus, Theodosius, they were, they're all fathers of mana energies and monotheism. So the Oriental heterodox, they will say that we're not monotelites, but the argument is, it, it doesn't matter if you think that you're not monotelite or you're monotelite. The argument is that you're, you, you do lead to monotelitism and your theology leads to monotelitism. And that's why you're wrong. And we can... I will say that's pretty much like the the issue of Wills and their view of their new yeah. quasi Platonic, quasi uh, Aristotelian view of the universe and Christology really has damaged the Oriental heterodox theology and as a, as a matter and as well you know it's not just the theology a lot of people think in praxis we're the same as well we're not the same in praxis either I mean one example is the church I went to. The uh, Syriac Church. There was no iconostasis there. There was no iconostasis. So that's one of the proxies. Well, the Pope Shinauda wrote a, a paper uh, uh, not too long ago saying there's no such thing as theosis. It sounded like a James. It sounded like James White wrote it. So I mean, it's completely ridiculous. But I mean, uh, you know, he's supposed to be what the successor to Athanasius. I mean, Athanasius has countless uh, talks on uh, letters and and yeah, statements yeah. on deification. So really ridiculous. But. Uh, just to hammer this home with what we're saying here is that what we're going to see in the triad is going to be consistent with our Christology. So if we understand that in the triad, because there's one divine nature, if will is a faculty of nature, then there's only going to be one will in God. If the if will is a, uh, uh, if energy is the action of will, the movement of the will, then we're going to see that energy is also proper to nature, and that there's one energy in God in the sense of there being one source, as John Damascus says in Book One. But there's also many energies because of many actions of God, right? And this is another dishonest thing that Taylor Marshall does and, and other Roman Catholics. They'll go to John Damascus and they'll pick the section in book one where he says that God has one energy because he's he's singular. There's one God from whom the energies, the energies proceed. Uh, and then ignore the sections where he later goes on to talk about many energies. And that's because there's different actions of God. Duh. Walking on water is not the same action as creating the world. Duh. And so if we understand that, then we understand that in the triad, there's three persons. The father is the monarchia. He's the uh, unbegotten arche and principle of the Godhead. He communicates 
and beget, he, he eternally begets the Son and communicates that full divine power and nature to the Son. So the Son is the direct offspring of the Father's nature, right? So nature is, he, Jesus doesn't uh, generate from the common nature of God. He doesn't generate himself. The Spirit doesn't generate him. He's from the Father's nature, and that's very important to Orthodox theology. And then the Holy Spirit comes from the Father through the Son from all eternity. So that's Orthodox Trinitarian procession, you could say. And then with uh, uh, Christ, and by the way, all of the energies and actions of God, they also proceed in the same triadic way, from the Father through the Son and the Holy Spirit. Right. So the creation of the world, it went this way. The experience of divine foreknowledge comes this way. Right. The action of mercy in the world is from the Father through the Son and the Spirit. Right. So the economic and the uh, theologic all have the same triadic approach. They're all the same triadic model or mode, you could say. Now, in the incarnation, um, Christ, who is this second hypostasis, this second hypostasis, the Son, right? I can't do that. Second hypostasis of the Trinity, the Son, took on human nature. He's a divine hypostasis, the Logos from all eternity. So he already possesses, possesses his full hypostatic quality and property, but he takes on a fully human nature and thus possesses two natures, two wills, and two energies because nature, or excuse me, energy and will are faculties or properties of nature. So if Christ is fully human and fully divine, then by necessity, he has to have two wills and two nature. If we say something erroneous, such as that will is a faculty of person. How many wills does God have? He would have three. But nobody says that the Trinity has three wills. Nobody. Literally. Not any. I've never heard any person say this. Maybe some crazy guy in a strip mall, non-denominational church thinks this. But um, in all Trinitarian theology, nobody has ever proposed that there's three wills in the Trinity. Well, if there's not three wills in the Trinity, then if then that means that will, that will has to be a faculty or property of nature. And if that's the case, and if Christ has two natures, then he has two wills and two energies, you see. So, and it's also important to mention as well that in Christ in the Incarnation, the human nature, human will, and human energy are fully deified. That doesn't mean that they cease to be human. They retain their natural properties, right? Both of the natures do. So his humanity can be deified and still be human. Go ahead. Uh, uh, one, thing, one thing I I'm also going to note uh, that's also very crucial in in this is that if if you mix if you confuse nature and person, there's also a huge consequence in Trinitarian theology, and this is pretty simple. If nature equals person, then how many persons are there in the Trinity? Well, in Roman Catholic apologetics, you see this emphasis on uh, on the absolutely simple essence. But if you really took that to its logical conclusion, then you shouldn't even be Trinitarian, right? So confusing nature and person, this is something that Severus himself does as well, and he confuses nature with hypostasis. And so also in his view... There will be one God, right? At most, maybe you could say there, there will be like one person in the Trinity, but then Christ suddenly came out because he has a human hypostasis. Complete nonsense. So that, it's very crucial to understand that uh, nature and person are not the same thing. The fathers have consistently uh, argued for this as well. And I guess to finalize in regards to the Oriental heterodox, uh, in praxis, other criticisms I will give to them is I, I talked about this um, at the beginning of the street, uh, not beginning, but an hour ago about, what was it? Uh, circumcision, right? So circumcision is still a <clears throat> thing in the Coptic church. And in the 12th century, when circumcision was going on, the Coptic church tried to tackle it. They didn't tackle it by straight up banning circumcision. They didn't do that. They instead said, you can circumcise your children just circumcise it before baptism, as if that's gonna matter. I don't, I don't see why. I don't see how. Like, I don't see what's the logic behind it. And so there is an aspect of Judaizing in the in the in the Coptic Church. And, and there yeah, well, Ar Armenians. Uh, some of the Armenians still do uh, sacrifice a chicken or something. This is silly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so 
a lot of people think that pr praxeologically we're the same, but no, we're very different, both in theology. That's, that's the thing I really dislike about this whole thing is people think that we're the exact same thing as the Oriental heterodox, first of all, because of the name, which is silly, but also because, oh, it seems like these theological differences, these seem to just be a uh, linguistic misunderstanding. I mean, this sort of view is stupid. Do you think the Holy Spirit is unable to go beyond linguistics it's it's so silly i mean sure linguistics they're an aspect, they're an aspect of, reality. of reality well then if that was the case it was that, if that was the case the gospel couldn't be translated into all the languages of the world and it was exactly. just retarded yeah it's completely stupid and so hopefully i managed to show you that not only are we different than the oriental heterodox but there's so many different doctrines that we diverge on and as i said if you talk to this about an oriental heterodox they will deny the monoenergist claims the point is simply that that's what the theology leads to because of confusion of nature and person and because of the rootedness of energy and will being in the hypostasis, not in the nature. And um, <clears throat> that will pretty much cover everything I have to say, I think. Regarding it's also covered. I did a whole talk on I did questions. a whole talk on this book as well. This book also covers the nature person distinction very well. It covers the the mistake of the Eutychians and the Apollinarians of uh, uh, confusing a faculty with nature or confusing a faculty with hypostasis, um, a similar mistake that heretics have made relating to the confusion of nature and person. So if you want another source on all this, uh, listen to my talk on Lossky, uh dogmatic theology, or you can just read the book. Yeah, all right, sounds good. So are we going to do an AMA? Or yeah, let's go ahead and get to the questions because we've been going for uh, yeah. a good while now. And um, yeah. last yeah. few, uh, let's see, I have a couple of references. Um, again, we did a whole talk on this. Uh, if you if you want an, an, a good example of how not to fall into the word concept fallacy, uh, within the first few chapters, you have a good explanation of how we do and don't use Aristotle according to St. Maximus Confessor. So in one way, he talks about how the three terms of Aristotle, beginning, middle, end, RK, uh, sub, uh, God is sustaining the world, and then the telos of the world, he says that there's a sense in which we do apply that to God and a sense in which we don't and can't. That's how there is and isn't natural theology. So uh, natural theology, that's another term that Maximus uses. He does not mean the Thomistic view. That's why we can't fall into the word concept fallacy. So uh, that's a good one. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about how Orthodox theology and Trinitarian theology developed after, by the way, there's not just councils six, seven slash eight. There's also medieval councils that are binding for us, right? The Palamite councils, they're covered in crisis in Byzantium by Papadakis, a really good book. Council Black Rene, most famously, which deals with eternal manifestation. Those are binding councils for us. Um, and then of course, don't forget the one that nobody will read. The dialogue between Orthodox and a barley mite, which vindicates everything we talk about. So let's get to the questions here. Um, now's your time for if you haven't uh, launched your super chat question for us. Now's the time because we're going to uh, work towards the end here. And what a great stream. Wow, we covered a lot of stuff. We really I've been meaning to deal with the Oriental question for a long time. You've got a lot of books that we've referenced. Um, I've been ref I've been recommending those books for years. So I'm glad that we finally are getting people to read them and getting interested in the topic and hopefully we'll have some good fruits come out of all this so thank you to ben for becoming a new member uh, uh posted quite a few in the last week talks uh, in the community section tab if you're a new member and you've joined on youtube you can also join at the website as well kola mahain kavanaha whatever new member thank you k we'll call you k skull duggery nerd bear the reprehensible happy to support you guys thanks for the gravy thinking of that white rapper dude like the new vanilla ice gravy young gravy a bald guy creation five dollars there is no message well thank you bald guy uh, for your non-message message d dog five dollars dollar dollar bill y'all thank you d dollar alexander 199 have you read alistair mcintyre yes i read multiple works of mcintyre in undergrad i uh, read his uh whose uh, rationality which justice and i've read his essays on language in the isaiah berlin book on political theory um the collection corneliu Cadrianu 100 knox jay have you ever thought of doing videos on lives of the saints miracles 
uh, and contrasting them with Catholic saints. We just did a talk with uh, Ortho Bro Snack, two hour talk on uh, the pre list of Roman Catholic saints contrasted with our saints. But certainly more talks could be done. A um, good book on this is uh, Herman Middleton's book on Precious Vessels of the Holy Spirit, Lives of the Elders of Greece. It's a good book to read. Um, I've met Herman. He's a really cool guy. Um, Michael Cerulari is $2. What is that with Pope Boniface X on Twitter? Would you debate him? I would be awesome to debate one of the conclavist replacement popes. Heck yeah, I would debate that guy. Uh, it would have been fun to debate one of the Palmyrian schismatic crazy guys, but uh, the last one, Gregory the Seventeenth, resigned because he found uh, a, a a chick he liked, and so he Mary no longer speaks to him one on one. He's found a chick, and but but the Palmyrians have elected a new pope. So yeah, it would be great to. I would uh, have a great fun conversation with him, with any of the uh, anti-popes uh, of that whole sphere of things. That would be a lot of fun. Amy Polino, 20 bucks. Thank you, Amy. Wow. Fat super chat. Michael Cerularis, two bucks. What does Song of Solomon 2-3 mean? Explain, please. Well, I assume that you're once again referring to the uh, controversy that we've had a whole, the whole last week was nothing but people losing their mind over issues that uh, I'll try to talk in a PG way about uh, as to what things are appropriate for married Orthodox couples. That's what the whole context of the debate was about. Um, first principle is that you don't make this determination by Googling medieval penitential monastic disciplines as father deacon, Dr. Ananias pointed out in his most recent talks. These are questions for you and your spiritual father. You're, you're, uh, uh, you're not, here to uh, to interpret all the ancient canons and apply them like bishops do. You're not a bishop. We do have an authority in the Orthodox Church, and the, uh, it's the bishop who interprets the canons. It doesn't mean you can't read the canons and try to understand them, but you you don't come online and try to enforce these canons. It's not your role. Secondly, the Song of Solomon is about marital love, and it's very explicit. It's very graphic. Nobody doubts that. Thirdly, I don't deny that the Song of Solomon also has a Christological import. Of course it does. It's an allegory based on the marital love between Solomon and one of his wives. The dumb arguments about what the term S-O-D-O-M-Y means has nothing to do with marital oral relations. That is not true. That is a Protestant reinterpretation of what that term means. I don't know when in Protestant America. It didn't mean that if you read the, the uh, way that St. Justinian prosecutes certain crimes, S-O-D crimes, he prosecuted them not to mean marital relations between husband and wife. It's very obvious. Any scholars that you read about what the biblical Hebrew term means, what the term means in the Septuagint, it doesn't mean that. Uh, so basically the whole stupid argument did nothing but vindicate me. And the easiest way that I put the nail in the coffin on that was the many texts in Proverbs and Song of Solomon that talk about the, uh, uh, how can I word this? The husband's enjoyment of the female teat. That is not a, an action that procreates. That is a foreplay action. It involves the mouth, uh, and yeah, there you go. That's not S-O-D-O-M-Y, dum-dums. So you just vindicated me in this stupid argument causing a huge bunch of internet argument over nothing. It was it was one of the stupidest arguments I've ever had online, L literally one of the dumbest, one of the, the dumbest, and it just made a bunch of people look silly. And these people are like a bunch of 15-year-old people who've never even had a date, so... Anyway, moving on, um, I, no, I'm sorry, but I'm right about the Song of Solomon. I don't know what to tell you. If you're more prudish than God, then take that up with the Bible. The book of Ezekiel has dirty jokes. I'm sorry, I didn't put it there. The Puritans, did you know the Puritans wouldn't read Song of Solomon because of this? They wouldn't read the sections of Ezekiel that had those jokes. I mean, I, I didn't write Ezekiel. I didn't write Song of Solomon. Your, your, your argument is not with me. Alexander, $2. Uh, get Michael... H on and make him orthodox. Well, it's not, I've, I've asked for these kinds of discussions in the past. Um, he is a big fan of one of our most 
absurd opponents. So no, I'm not going to interact with those kinds of people. Jay, can I, can I, can I say something? Absolutely. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to hurry. I don't want to keep you do it. Yeah. Feel free to butt, butt in anytime you, I was just going to, yeah, I was just going to say in regards to that whole controversy, it, it did at least give something really cool. Uh, some, one of the dudes in that whole stupid issue regarding foreplay and whatever is that some guy on Twitter, I don't, I still don't know who this guy is, but some guy from discord made a Twitter and he said that I, me, he said, I am the guy that keeps track of these things, whatever those things are. And I like, I'm like an enforcer that uh, ferrets out the centers as if like we're running some cult or something when it's just a Discord server. And it's it's so, it's so funny. These people are, the, the, the people we, we are dealing with sometimes, like it, this is one of the things that people on the internet should not do. They take the internet, I mean, in some aspects it is serious, but they take it hyper seriously where they like have a joke persona but they push the joke persona too hard and it just creates a big mess like that. It just wastes everyone's time. Yes. But that's one of the funny things that came up, like I'm um, some kind of enforcer. It just makes me look cool, I think. <laughs> that's that's just what what I want. You're the Praetorian yeah. guard of the Discord server. You're like the yeah. you're the yeah. you're the Pope's <laughs> Swiss guard. Um I'm not the real Pope, by the way. We have a secret Pope. Maybe uh, Father Deacon yes. Doctor yes. Father Deacon Doctor Ananias is the secret black pope of the of my discord but by the way did you know did you know that the uh, fake orthodox uh i'm not gonna even use their name but the fake orthodox who has a very weak youtube channel they said that like you're sponsoring me in that time like you're like your puppet or something like, it's so <laughs> it's so silly yeah so uh by the way we we always at all times constantly encourage people that they have to find an actual Orthodox Church. Now, if you don't live near one, then you know you can't do that. But uh, uh, we always stress that this is not an online thing. You have to have a church. You have to be under spiritual guidance. So there's by definition, there, it's, it can't be a cult. So um, Ro Rodion Raskolnikov, five bucks. Are we simply a product of our parents' DNA and social environment? In what way does the individual exist? Uh, no, this is a great question because this is precisely why we think that you know you are given a soul, a mind a noose faculties, right. And a body. And those are not just biological products. I mean, those are, these are all elements that go into you, but you can't smush any of these into one singular definition. Hypostasis or person is not just, this is the wrong conception that people in the modern West have that a person is just an individual guy with a body and a mind and a will. No, uh, it's very precise in our theology. The, the, you have to understand these terms and what they mean. That's why we've been going through this. And so uh, who you are as a person is more than just an instance of nature. You are an instance of nature, but you're not just one particular instance of nature. You're also a distinct individual. Uh, I forgot which Rodion uh, made in the image of God. Right? And in, in the same way, each of the persons in the triad, right? They're individuals, but they're not just individuals they they are more than that the son is not just some instance of, of divine nature he it really is a eternally begotten son so uh in the same way in a similar way we're not just the mix of our parents dna and, and the social environment we're also given a soul we're given a noose we're given a distinct individual hypostatic existence josh baker five bucks did jesus know his fate when he was born yes because he was a divine person from all eternity and he communicated to his divine nature the uncreated gifts and graces that the divine possessed right so he deifies his human nature and so even though he really did grow in wisdom and knowledge in his humanity in another sense from all eternity he possessed those things uh fully from his incarnation because he's a divine person so Jesus was not fallible. He did not possess a numbing will. He didn't discursively reason about things like he didn't know the future. Oh, I don't know. What am I going to do? Should I get down from the cross? I don't. This is the Arian Nestorian Jesus. That's not our Jesus, right? Our Jesus is the only single soul subject of all his incarnate actions is the eternal Logos. Um, so if, if so, could we say that the lifetime he had was perfect in timing all the way to his last breath. I'm not sure what you mean by his lifetime being perfect in timing. I mean, he, he is the, 
second person of the Godhead. So he created the world and he determined when he would come to, to be born. He willed to be born and he willed to die and he willed to resurrect because he's God. Right? He's not a human person. Walrus Lolbertarian, uh, Canadian 5. Do you find the Orthodox Church open to other ethnic groups in the West? Uh, yeah, I go to a Russian Orthodox Church and I'm not Russian. Will it catch on considering the Western churches are failing in major ways? Yeah, if the U.S. Uh, deep state, CIA, NATO, State Department doesn't completely destroy and, and wreck uh, American Christianity and Orthodoxy. Yeah, they're trying to rip it in half. I mean, uh, the Patriarch of Moscow just came out and said that the CIA is essentially trying to destroy the Orthodox Church, and that's exactly what's happening. David, you have to go? Oh, he went to the bathroom. Uh, no, no, yeah, do you have any comments on uh, um, the – I mean, David's in Turkey, so I, he may not have much of an opinion, but, I mean, yeah, yeah. You have, do you have any comment no, on but, that? Uh, I do have some stuff to say. So what was the question again? First question of, was, um, yeah. is orthodoxy in the West open to other ethnic groups? I said yes. Um, and then it yeah, – Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, will it catch on considering that many of the Protestant Catholic churches in the West are collapsing? I think it is already catching on. Like I was in the U.S. for one and a half years, so I kind of had that feeling. And from what I've seen is I went to a lot of churches and there is a lot of converts. And generally speaking, that's how you know the the rhythm of what's going on. If there's a lot of converts, well, naturally, that means there's a lot of people converting, right? That's simple logic. And I will say yeah, there's a lot of influx uh, from Protestants and Roman Catholics and people from Protestantism because they stayed and they realized, wow, you know, this is kind of just empty. There's some theology, but every day I'm going to an empty library and nothing's going on. I want to go to a real experience. But then they see Roman Catholicism, they look at the Pope, they look at the whole structure and they say, this is no way the church that was established 2000 years ago. Give me the church that was established 2000 years ago. And they find orthodoxy. Some of them unfortunately find oriental orthodoxy. Um, one thing I will add in regards to uh, parishes, I mean, a lot of people, I've said this in my stream, a lot of people had this kind of a silly view, and I had this view, right? This is something I struggle with. A lot of people think that in Orthodox churches, there's going to be like guards, like checking people that came to the church for the first time or whatever. That's not really how it works, especially in the U.S. It, uh, it's actually much better because in my case, I go to a Russian church and uh it's mostly Russian. Everyone there speaks Russian. A lot of people there speak Turkish, not the priests. But uh, so if I didn't know how Orthodox churches operated beforehand, I won't really know much. But in the United States, that's really different. A lot of people are making it. They're doing their best to make it easy for newcomers because they are seeing a lot of people join the faith and the catechumenate process, which I think is a very serious process, should be taken very seriously if you're a catechumen. That process is reviving. It's, be, it's seeing a revival in the Orthodox world, particularly in the West. And uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of... Yeah, I'm glad Orthodox you mentioned that. Problems. While we're talking about that, I'm going to have to uh, uh, add that video because you made it one of the great uh, practical videos. Let's see, what's the quickest way I can go to your your page here? On catechumens, because a lot of times catechumens make mistakes, and that's kind of one thing we want to talk about. That, and you did a really good video on that because I made all the same mistakes that you mentioned in your video. And we always, you know, we're always getting questions about catechumens. So I'm going to add his, if you guys haven't subscribed to him, uh, his channel is linked. Um, but definitely watch his, I'm going to put it in the chat right now, his uh, tips uh, for catechumens. Because if you are a catechumen or going to be one, then you're going to... Um, want to know these tips because they're very helpful. Um, I made a lot of those same mistakes and that's a good one. All right. So let's get to, uh, let's see who's next. John Paleologus, five bucks. Why didn't the term Roman become a synonym for bureaucratic nightmare? Like in Byzantium, it has, <laughs> I mean, look at Rome. Now the papacy is a giant bureaucratic nightmare. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I do. I mean, the term Byzantine is actually referring to exactly what he said. So, and Byzantine, 
I mean, the word Byzantium, it just means Constantinople, actually. That's the Byzantine rite is the Constantinopolitan rite. So it's just referring to Constantinople. So in a way, yeah, I mean, Rome, well, the Eastern way of saying Rome, Byzantium, is uh, not the Western way of saying Rome, which is Byzantium. Byzantine is already means like bureaucratic mess. So uh, you could say that the Roman Catholic Church is a Byzantine church in that sense. It's a, it's a, it's a huge mess. And speaking of those terms, another funny thing you could say is that, well, the Orthodox Church is the Roman Orthodox Church. And as a matter of fact, the Turks, when they refer to us, when they refer to Orthodox Christians, they call us Rum Orthodox. Romeo, yeah. Greek Orthodox yeah. Rumor, yeah. So, and so, and they, actually, that literally means Roman, Roman Orthodox. So they call us the Roman Orthodox Church. And then the Roman Catholic Church, they, just, they, do, they refer to that as Roman Catholic Church as well. So that's kind of like a funny yeah, thing yeah. there. But Well, the la they're more yeah, like, it's more, more accurately, the Byzantine Church is the inheritor of the Roman Imperium. It is the, yes, yes. the Roman and Catholic Church because it is Catholic and universal, we believe. And the Roman Church is more like the Frankish Church. It's the yes, Franco-Latin exactly. Church, basically. Pretty much, and that's what the... Uh, that's what the Greek Orthodox refer to Rome as. They refer, they didn't refer to them as Roman Catholic. They call them Latins because they are. They're a different group. They're not Romans. We are the Romans. That's the sort of mindset they had. And hey, I, that's the, they were correct. I mean, they were Romans. The West wasn't. All right. So there's a guy who, let's see, I'm going to, I want to answer this guy's question because he's got a good one here. Um, so I'm going to add once again, somebody says, do you run the fake J Dyer? I, no, I don't run any of the fake ones. So I'm going to add to the description. You'd have to refresh the page. So here in the descriptor is the official J's analysis pages. Uh, I don't run any of the, uh, fake ones. So I've added to the description, my Patreon, my book, my Twitter, my Facebook, my Instagram, and that's the only ones. Anything else that has my name on it is not me. So, no, I'm not the fake Jay Dyer. I'm not any of those. Dalton, $25. Thank you, Dalton. Jay, in your next book series uh, on Do the New Atheists and all the absurd philosophical conclusions that they come to in their books. Lawrence, I've been meaning to do one of those. You're right, I should. Um, I was thinking about Dawkins just because everybody talks about him, but maybe I should pick a Lawrence Krauss one if he's got a funny one. And you say that Lawrence has a hilarious satanic conclusion when they make positive statements. Yeah, Le Krauss says that we're all made of stars, man. We're, we're star stuff. We're star to every man is a star. That's all from Crowley. Actually, uh, Daniel Spaulding has an old essay at Soul of the East where he talks about uh, Lawrence Krauss being basically making Crowleyan arguments. But uh, yeah, it's a good idea, Dalton. Thank you. John Paleologus, $2. No, I don't run the, the fake J. Dyer account. All of my official accounts are now linked there. Um, can next, I, Can I add something? I think I know sure. what yeah. account he's talking about. Yeah, you're talking about, if he's talking about the Twitter account, no, that's some, that's some guy on Discord. Uh, called Holy C, I think. Nothing's holy about that guy. And he really, the reason why I did that is because of that whole like foreplay, like that stupid uh, discussion. And he made a YouTube account, a very blasphemous video. I'm not even going to go into detail about the video. And he's made, he like, one of the things he made, one of the memes he made is literally depicting Jay in hell. So these are the sorts of people that you're dealing with. You know, that's that's what you're dealing with, right? That people, they can't argue. They All they do is depict others in hell. Uh, so that's the person that's running that account. Just block It's just a teenager. It's just it. a teenager. I mean, you can hear the guy's voice. Like, he yeah. hasn't even hit puberty yet when you hear him talk. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah, so don't engage with those people. I agree. I agree. It's, uh, not, it's not even worth engaging. Um, 799A, I-X-O-Y-E, right? The Senate, the Greek... Uh, What's the what is it when a word stands for when a letter stands for for a word? Um, he says, David, are there any parishes in Turkey which do liturgies in Turkish? Uh, not regularly, but I did hear. I I actually got a DM just this week by someone who says that uh, there is a parish that does uh, liturgies in Turkey, uh, Turkish in Saturdays at Taksim. Uh, I don't know which church yet, but I do plan to go on there. For a Saturday to see, but so far the only liturgies, the only churches that do Turkish liturgies, uh, well, they're the non-canonical Turkish Orthodox churches, which 
I think they should. I hope something happens because I don't know why they're even on Canonical. I mean, I know kind of the history, but there's some. It, it's it needs to be solid. The EP doesn't care, which is a tragedy. And the only church that do liturgy Turkish, canonically speaking, I haven't seen any so far. If there was, I'd probably go there. But the best, the other best option for me is going to a Russian church, uh, and that's what I've been doing. I, the things that EP does. Uh, it really makes me feel like it. It's not as if there's no grace there. I don't take the fake Orthodox position. It's just that it makes me feel bad. Like I, I will feel bad if I went to that church. Like it will be bad on my conscience. So that's why I go to a Russian church. But if there was a parish that the liturgy is in Turkish, I'd probably visit that church often. I would say, but I've so far I haven't seen any. Acronym was the word I was going for. Thank you in the chat there. Um, somebody asked about Celtic Orthodoxy. No, that's a that's a heretical, non-canonical group. We don't do that. Um, J2 Nick says, for 26, he says, thought on the new Kanye album, lads. Jay, will you do a review? Uh, I listened to about three minutes of it, different samples, and a couple of them I liked. Um, I don't have a positive or negative view. Of, I, use, I'll list, I listened to the first couple Kanye albums back when he first was fresh on the scene and i haven't really followed kanye in the last several years but uh a couple of the tracks i liked any comment i i i, I want to add on that i listened to some of the uh i listened to the whole album it was short it's i liked it and some of the songs i think has a lot of meaning like behind like uh um one of the songs one of the songs was about uh having enough so basically it was about adam and eve and kanye was basically saying you already have enough don't eat the apple like that there was that kind of a message which i really liked in that song and uh let me find the title of the song itself uh spotify okay it's everything we need it's like two minute song and it's like not the whole thing but one part of the song is about how you already have everything you need and that everything you need is god and that don't be like Adam. Don't eat the apple. Like they, I like that aspect of the song, and I, it's 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 something that you could review on. I mean, it's something int- I think it's pretty interesting to see this sort of an album. Like I thought there will be kind of like satanic, I don't know, something in the album that's very questionable. But the album's pretty decent, I'd say. Yeah, and by the way, I'm trying to be. Uh, I'm not talking about the the church in England for the first, you know, within the first millennium of Christianity. Uh, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about this group nowadays called the Celtic Orthodox Church or whatever. That's a non-canonical group. But the church, uh, there are plenty of Western saints in the history of uh, Western Christianity prior to the split. Absolutely. Um, all right. So uh, that's all I see. Uh, remember to subscribe to David's channel. It's linked there in the description. All my links to the officials are there so people don't get me mixed up with fake accounts. I'll get one last one. Rolfing Stakes, five bucks. What are your thoughts on the G, uh, the genuine and the old calendar and the great question? And David has a good couple videos on that. David, you want to mention your two videos at your channel on the true Orthodox and uh, uh, the, uh, you had a really good video too on the virus of, of communion uh, point that they always make. You want to comment real quick on those before we head out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, you can check those videos out, uh, Raffling Stakes. But the basic, uh, the TLDR that I will see, say what my thoughts on the fake Orthodox are. First of all, I call them fake Orthodox. So that's already an indication of my opinion. But the issue with them is that they're, they're, here's the thing. A lot of people think that they're not even heretics, which is I will contend with that because their view of ecclesiology is radically different than ours. So when a patriarch is uh, preaches heresy, when a patriarch preaches heresy even openly, that doesn't suddenly mean that he's automatically excommunicated. But for the fake orthodox, if you're in communion with an openly heretic patriarch, uh, that means that you should uh, you either excommunicate him or you're poisoned. You're also a heretic. Now this sort of view is incompatible. Very simple example I made in my communion line theory uh, video is using an example of St. Kirill in the 5th century uh, aftermath of the Ephesian Council. After the Council of Ephesus, there was a reunion with the Antiochian Church. What happened in the Antiochian Church afterwards, the union, is that a lot of them wanted Nestorius back. There's a council that 
literally says Nestorius is condemned, right? They openly support Nestorianism. They openly want Nestorius to be freed. And so by that logic, St. Kirill is in communion with those people. Uh, the rest of the Orthodox world is in communion with those people. That means the entire church went into apostasy. I mean, that this is such a silly argument. And the, another issue is that they take Canon 15 of the First Second Council, which we actually talked about in the beginning of the video, out of context. The context is exactly as I described in the beginning of the video. Uh, a pseudo-bishop, it's not pseudo-bishop in the complete full sense. So, for example, Patriarch Bartholomew uh, is not pseudo-bishop to the point where everyone under him has zero grace. That's not how it works. That's not what it's referring to as well. It's referring to those who preach open heresy, and if you excommunicate them, which is what Russia did with Constantinople, if you excommunicate them, it says you're not creating a schism. It says that you can do this. That's what the Council Canon says. And so it's a misunderstanding of the Council Canon. And even then, to my knowledge, I might be wrong, but to my knowledge, the only source of the new calendar being heretical, which is the basis of the old calendar's argument, that's a forgery. So the Sigillian of 1651, that's a forgery. It doesn't actually condemn. Now, the Sigillian is not a forgery, but some of the things in it are, forger are forgery. So the only thing that condemns the new calendar is actually a forgery, meaning that the new calendar is not anatomized. And because it's not an anatomized, you created a schism out of something that's not even anatomized. You're the real schismatics. And as I said, the, or, the fake Orthodox, they have a completely different view of e e ecclesiology. And I think that will qualify them also as heretics. So they're not only schismatics, but they're also heretics in that, in that regard. So that's my thought on the Jews. And I will say... I wish they came back into communion because I think they will be very valuable. The problem is because they separate themselves from us, they're kind of weakening our position. And the CIA, as Jay mentioned so many times, the CIA exactly wants this, is exactly what they want. They pull the, uh, the people that will be defending against the new calendar and other stuff away from the church. And so what do we have? Well, we have the people that could be defending against these horrible things away from us. So we end up being weaker. And that is exactly the plan of you know, all the alphabet agencies and all the powerful agents in play regards in regards to, to religion. religion. Yeah, and let's once again, I'll share that uh, article that somebody wrote over at Ortho Christian that I've been talking about for many, many, many years that the schismatic groups are used by the CIA. And somebody wrote a really good article there. Here it is in the chat. Check out that uh, vindicates my analysis of the uh, rogue horse schismatic groups. Um, the ones that split out. Uh, they were being used quite obviously. It's like a no-brainer. Um, so let me add that article too to the description of the show. All right, we've been going on for a long time. Uh, I'm going to do another stream tonight, guys, on Exorcist. It is what 6:45, maybe maybe 10 o'clock tonight my time. So if you want to come back for the Exorcism stream tonight at 10, if you're not doing anything, guys, Friday night. Friday night movie streams with Jay. We had a great theology stream. Thank you so much to David. Subscribe to his work. Check out all the links. Um, come back tonight at 10, somewhere in there, for The Exorcist, Exorcist 2, Exorcist 3, Kabbalah box movie, Exorcism movie, <laughs> what else? Fallen and Constantine. We'll do that tonight. I, I'm behind on that. We had internet issues. But thank you, David. Hope you had a good time. It was a lot of fun. You brought some really, it really. Was, it was. Yeah. You brought some really uh, high quality research to the table, and I look forward to another chat in the future. Yes. Yeah. Same. Thank you. Thank All you. right. God bless everybody. Have a good night.